Good morning, everyone. I welcome you to this session by the Ocular Trauma Society of India and the Urban Eye Hospitals. We welcome this great initiative by the Urban Eye Hospitals to bring to all of you the updated latest management of the ocular trauma. We all know the significance of ocular trauma, the, point count, the kind of uh, mortality uh, to, in, in the sense of blindness and the morbidity that it leads to all over the world. And a good management, we know, can make a huge difference to the amount of the number of eyes that we can save and thereby make a difference to a huge number of lives. Excellent session that we had with the National Human Rights Commission worked with all the agencies in trying to think about that coordination to minimize trauma and to improve the network to carry out an improved management of ocular trauma all over the country. We need to work together towards that goal and to form ocular trauma services in all tertiary centers by having a coordinator who's passionate about the subject and who would coordinate with other subjects to provide the best possible services and take care of the education component is very, very important. And this is what Ocular Trauma Society has been emphasizing. And uh, this excellent initiative by the Arvind Eye Hospital and Dr. Naresh Babu in bringing this particular session to you is therefore most welcome. I would request Dr. Naresh Babu to say a few words on behalf of the Arvind Eye Hospital, and then we can start off with the scientific proceedings. Thanks to Mehul for having brought together this excellent faculty. We now have an excellent registry system, which is a joint system, which All India Ophthalmic Society, Ocular Trauma Society has, ad has adopted from the initiative by Asia Pacific Ocular Trauma Society, led by Rupesh. And we need to become a part of it. And coordinators in each tertiary center should be able to put in that data, which is a very simplified way of protecting, bringing out your data for the purpose of good of everyone. So over to Dr. Naresh Babu for his perspective and thanks for his initiative in bringing this to all of you. Thank you very much, sir. Actually, I would like to thank Dr. Mehul Shai. Basically, it was his initiative. We met in uh, Chennai I, and he wanted to have this. And uh, Grover sir knows well this, uh, we have been having as an IC in the uh, AOC for the almost last uh, 12 years actually, and it's one of the well attended. And unfortunately, trauma is one of the most neglected and we all work in uh, the separate islands. We don't get together. That's why we are not able to pool in data. Maybe in future, I think we should have a proper coordination so that we can have such a huge data, which is uh, going unutilized uh, for uh, publications. So I think for want of time, I'll stop with this and we can straight away go and over to Dr. Mayul Chas. Please, sir. So I hope that uh, we are starting with the scientific uh, proceedings and without wasting much of our time, uh, we'll call Dr. Rupesh Agrawal to talk about his uh, brainchild about the eye gets and uh, ocular trauma classification, new initiatives. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mehul. Thank you, OTSI. Thank you, uh, my mentor, Dr. Grover, sir, and uh, all the faculties uh, here on the dais and all the uh, delegates, of the, uh, the medical students and residents, hopefully they are attending. Thanks for the opportunity. I know I've been given 10 minutes uh, and uh, it's a bit difficult to come up with uh, what we have learned about the ocular trauma classification and uh, the topic, the initial, the first topic itself. Now, uh, I de deliberately given the time to revisit because most of the classifications over a period of time we have uh, revised. And this uh, diagram does so that trauma starts from the front and it can go behind. It does not respect the artificial segmentation we have done into the anterior or the posterior segment. It does not say, okay, I'm going to hit only the front of the eye. I'm not going to hit the back of the eye. It can encompass any part of the eye. Therefore, it becomes a bit more complicated. How do you classify? How do you kind of say, okay, up to cornea, uh, anterior segment surgeon stitch, and then uh, behind the behind the cornea sclera is taken care by the retina surgeon or someone else who is more familiar with the sclera. 
And therefore, this classification, which was proposed in 1997, which was more of a theoretical classification for mechanical injuries, has been there. And uh, the way it has been classified classically, we are teaching all of our medical students, all the residents, all the junior doctors about the trauma can be classified as open globe, closed globe injury, and open globe injury is a laceration and rupture. And Dr. Mayul and I, we do know that how many times we commonly misuse uh, the term of rupture and laceration, though they both might have prognostic uh, outcome significance. And then within penetrating and perforating, uh, uh, unfortunately, Dr. Late uh, B. Sukla, sir, who has been uh, very strong about these words of perforating and penetrating, not much work has been done into this place, including the intraocular foreign body, which has been sitting in a silo like that. Then three variables which were inputted by the, uh, the group of that classification uh, was the initial visual equity, the RAPD, and the location of the injury and the type of injury. And these variables, along with the classification, were supposed to affect the outcome of the variable. Now, we need to check whether is that still relevant or uh, something has, else has come. So, what are the merits about it? That it reduces the decrease ambiguity in the communication and also helps prognosticate the outcome in most of the injury cases. This is where this classification has led to uh, us to kind of believe. However, we should also think that only the mechanical eye injuries are classified, not other types of injury. Does not take into consideration the lid adnexia orbit into the classification, which I believe, and we all know that, particularly Dr. Grover, sir, who else will know better than that, that the lid adnexia orbit has a role to play in the outcome. Visual equity given lots of significance and the single factor can affect, uh, make or break in a patient of outcome of a trauma. RAPD again is in considered as an absolute biomarker for the lost eye and once the RAPD is done, people have kind of left that eye and not done much work on that. Zone 1 given a lot of significance, but we never decided whether the zone 1 involving the visual axis or not involving the visual axis. We should divide the zone 1 and does not take into consideration the intraocular pressure, which has been uh, one of the important factors uh, there. And again, some of the terminologies and semantics about it. So, Dr. Mehul and I, we worked together on this paper uh, way back in 2013. And they, since then, we have given many numerous sessions and topics on what are the uh, possible controversies related to ocular trauma classification. Just to go through some of the controversies, we are not going to go into the depth of it. But just to give you a highlight about the as the as much as the trauma of uh, the topic of trauma is controversial, within tra trauma, there are still a lot of controversies there. Where the preoperative visual equity given significance zones of injury we have classified into uh, zone one, zone two, zone three, where we know that zone three is five millimeter behind the nimbus. But uh, what is the way? And that's where I believe the residents were attending, the junior doctors were attending. So kind of think about the research question: Why this magical number of five millimeter came up with? And I kind of reached out to Ferenkun and to discuss with him what is the 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 way the five millimeter was thought through, and then I picked up one of the uh, the books uh, which is now not seen commonly in the text on the text desk of the students, uh, uh, the Duane of Technology, which is probably only kept in the corner in the library, not touched, not touched at all. And uh, this one was the figure which was there, and it also mentions that uh, there is a recta and all those insertions. So if the spiral of tilex is there and uh, which is defined by end of corneoscular limbus behind and at the beginning of the past plana, which is there. What is the significance of it? So in one of my research work, I tried to classify and we, the zone 3 into zone 3 anterior to this, in within this 5 millimeter and zone 3, beyond the 5 millimeter. And we were surprised to see that zone 3, which are involving behind the 5 millimeter, where the poor outcome and zone 3 in, within that 5 millimeter band was not so bad. So, does we need to look into that factor as well? And does we need to pull the boundary of zone 3 from 5 millimeter to the insertion of rectangle? We don't know. But this is just one of the questions which we are asking. And this is where I encourage our uh, the younger researchers to think along this line. And I might be completely wrong, but this is where I started thinking as a, as a doctor about it. And then we kind of, once you think about it, you try and publish it as well. And then we publish this as a paper about looking into the zone 3 and the outcome it can look into that. Then subsequently was a no light perception, which uh, Dr. Newell and I, we have been working on it. Quite a number of patients in our uh, thing where no light perception to start with. But if you see only 33% were left, uh, were uh, rather 33% improved after the intervention was done in one form or other. So no light perception itself does not mean end of the game. And that's where we were able to publish from the research. Again, this paper was published. And one of the important things is that once you believe that there is something like that happening, it is not about what you say. It should be the way 
we should try and publish it. And this was again published in uh, one of the uh, journals. Uh, again, I, when I started my career in Singapore, and I was always fascinated by trauma. And therefore, what I did after coming to Singapore is we pulled out all the data, and then we started looking to that. And again, there are quite a number of controversies Good. there, including the lead and adnexion. Beautiful work done by Michael Grant on CART analysis, where he was able to show that the lead laceration can be affected with uh, the poorer outcome. And these are the some of the complex mathematical model which people start using. RAPD again was shown that can be affected by different different factors. And in the work which we did, RAPD was not shown to be as strong as some of the other factors, including the vitreous loss. Now you're not going to put down every single factor which comes from the multivariate into the model, and therefore a proper model need to be kind of uh, computed. And, and that's where we come up with this paper about the prognostic factor in which RAPD, RAPD could not get a very strong consensus to be causing it. Work done by Dr. Mehul Shah on traumatic cataract controversies once again. Uh, a, there is a lot of controversy on that. We are not going to get into the depth of it. He published this work in Canadian Journal of Ophthalmology. Now, very briefly, these are some of the many controversies which are there in the ocular trauma uh, classification. Ocular trauma score, which we have been following, so this is for your reference. But is this score enough, particularly in the current world when you have moved quite far? And I'm sure Dr. Nares will agree with me from three ports and of vitrectomy is gone to probably sutureless. And there's so many other things which have happened. Probably the people were more scared to operate a no light perception, but uh, with expertise like uh, Dr. Nares there, they must be operating quite a lot of uh, it. And then you might not get the same outcome as been defined in the literature. Beautiful mathematical model done by none other than uh, late Professor Sukla on the trauma index. So this was the applied mathematics which was went into this thing. Now, where do we go as far as the classification is that? Just give a couple of minutes before I wrap up. Uh, this is to give you a glimpse about the work which we have been doing from 2016. So one is about identifying the gaps. Second is publishing that. But then we need to move to the next step. So what we did is we never stopped there and we thought we need to kind of put together the fact, uh, put together these facts which we learned, then execute those facts, publish those into the papers, get the right mentors, sorry. And once we get the right mentors, uh, based on those mentors, we create a team which we created with Dr. Mehul and all the people and operationalize those teams and present that and then come up with the big data analytics. So we set up four objectives to collect the data which we've been doing. Then we also do some automated analysis and to do some survey. So we met with AIM-1 and AIM-3. AIM-2 is in progress. And then we eventually want to come up with a clinical disease uh, decision support system, which will be all based on the AIM-1. number one. And if you are able to do that AIM-1 number one properly, we'll be able to do that. Now, you can look into this paper on the AIM-1. And uh, uh, I do acknowledge that Dr. Mehul has contributed quite a lot, but his name is there as one of the contributors in this paper. Uh, about this, where we rolled out a survey about the classification of trauma is people agree or not agree and what are the terms, extra terms they want to keep it into that thing. So we went through a very standard technique of Delphi where a lot of debate happened and then finally we got the terms which were agreed by this global group of experts including the eye injury and everything and these were acceptable terms which was kept in the new classification but there were additional terms which was missing in the original classification of bats was inserted into this new classification. So how does a new and a old classification look like? It can be called as BAT++ or I-GATES classification because I-GATES is the name of the group which we have set up at a global level called as International Global and Nexal Trauma Epidemiology Study and nothing else like it is like uh, GATES is more better than we thought we should put it as I-GATES. Now, this is the new classification. Sorry, it looking very small font. But we came out with different mechanisms here. So that's the first thing which we hit. Then the second is uh, the type of uh, the organ or the part of the eye which is involved. And then th third again is about the zone of the trauma. Within this, you can see the few. These are very simple graphical thing which can be kept on your iPad, iPhone, uh, print out, and then you can insert it and get a final trauma score. This has been validated and I encourage every single hospital or every single eye center in India and worldwide to use this. And then we'll be looking into a very different uh, classification, which is more practical, more useful. And from this, you can also design an ocular trauma score. With that, uh, I'd like to thank once again the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present this work.
And I hope to kind of receive all the critical input from all of you so that uh, we can take this work forward and uh, we can try to make a change in this otherwise orphan discipline of ophthalmology, unfortunately. Thank you very much. Uh, all of you, you kindly give your inputs or feedbacks or questions to the Rupesh right now because uh, he will not be available at the end of the session. Thank you, Rupesh. I think you brought out some very pertinent points. Uh, the controversies exist a lot because there is a lot to learn. There is a lot of things that have to become evidence-based. And for that, data is critical, as you have pointed out. So as we get more and more data, we'll have more and more answers to the controversies that we have. Second aspect was about the um, relevance of the ocular trauma score and the current classification. As you pointed out, the technology has rapidly evolved and the surgical techniques have rapidly evolved. So the classification prognostic uh, management has to come in. Thanks for that excellent thought-provoking thing. And eye gates is something that is simple to use and should be a part of all tertiary institutions. I think, uh, Rupesh, can you share that uh, soft copy link for uh, that uh, one page uh, yeah. data to all the stakeholders so that they can also start using the same? Sure. I'll send a uh, link also and then soft copy as well. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Um, Rupesh, uh, the most important uh, point you have brought out is uh, the PL negative. Actually, yeah. uh, many people, in fact, they advise uh, enucleation or revisceration cases yes. PL negative. I think you have brought a very good point, uh, basically, like which many are not aware that we should go for uh, uh, what you call surgical intervention, even if the patient has got uh, no PL, because many people have got a, a useful vision at the end of the surgery, is actually after multiple surgeries. Yeah. 19%, 19% uh, is in our publication. We recovered vision from no PL. Dr. Rupes. Dr. Lopez? Yes, Jayanta, sir. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yes. So, lots of patients we face now following the road traffic accident with a lead injuries ultimately land up with some corneal problems. And most of the time, is, is there any possibilities from our society to include adnexa also? Because it's a very, very, very important part of ocular protection as well as the cornea or other point of view, like in optic nerve also, most of the time, some foreign bodies or vital may be a in metallic, in maybe a non-metallic, in rural background, lots of wooden foreign body inside the orbit is one of the big cause for lot of visual loss, though it was not initially addressed properly. So is there any possibilities in ocular trauma to include whole as a whole whole structure. Yeah, I know Dr. Lakshmi will be here and uh, she's been my teacher mentor. I therefore and Dr. Grover was my examiner. So I can't leave them out. And Dr. Ganga will kind of will not allow this classification to be published if I don't include this uh, adnexal. Though it's there. If you see this classification within this, we have included injury to canaliculi or lacrimal ducts and severe adnexal injury. Someone need to tick mark this one as well. So this is already there and it is already, we haven't come up with our own uh, trauma score yet because we don't have enough data yet. We have only touching 6,500 patients. My aim is to collect up to 100,000 patients before we can come up with a classification system or uh, before we can come up with a score, which will be weighted score based on which uh, part of the eye is involved. So right now, I'm not able to give any scores to adnexal injury or lens injury and all, but all the mechanisms about the machine learning, the deep learning, everything is in place. And uh, I just need more uh, information and then we'll be able to kind of say how much is the lead injury. Because one is from our own experience, but if the experience is uh, matched with the evidence, then we'll be able to come up with an experience and evidence-based uh, score, which will be more helpful for our society. It's it's there. It's there, as you said. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely, we can think now. Yes. Yeah. Dr. Mehul, we can proceed with the next. Yeah. Thank you, sir. We invite Dr. Lakshmi for uh, uh, with her presentation of complex periocular trauma. You can share your screen. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. 
I thank you, Mehul, Dr. Grover, sir, and all the panelists and speakers here uh, for this webinar. And uh, Rupesh, I think you have highlighted certain aspects so well. It's very meticulous. Uh, congratulations. And I really hope uh, we can take it forward. And maybe I can also be of some help. Um, now, complex periocular uh, trauma, I won't say it can be even a simple one can be very complex. Uh, the and this uh, I remember sharing this slide in my last year's talk. Uh, blend blunt and penetrating trauma to the key region can have a devastating effect. Now I said mentioned earlier the person to the patient to the left is more worried and about her condition with a third nerve palsy rather than the patient to the right there. Uh, so the first thing, when especially the last many years now, I'm working in multi-speciality hospitals. When you are called to the ICU, first you should see what is the condition and recognize the condition. And the most important aspect to the general condition, they'll say Glasgow score, score is this, this, this. It will be jargon for us because we are mainly concerned about the eye. So once the pay, you have looked at the systemic aspect and you're able to inspect a deed, and if in case... Uh, the, you or the patient cannot speak, please ask the attenders uh, about a detailed history because vision is very, very important as we all know. Alcohol use, child abuse, uh, uh, sexual abuse, documentation is so important and medical legal issues when the complex injuries are concerned. Not even in complex, it's, it's irrespective of the injury, any eye injury needs this. Um, again, going further into the inspection and devaluation, Penetrating injury should be suspected whenever there is history of trauma in the region of the eyelids. Meticulous inspection of the eyelids is very essential because if we are thinking of a foreign body, because if the patient is unconscious or the relatives are not able to tell you after a road accident what really happened at the site of the accident. So inspection is so important. You can sometimes, once the, if the patient is conscious and you're going to take up for repair as a sole ocular, uh, as an eye specialist, you please look for all these aspects. Give very gentle irrigation because uh, sometimes there may be iris prolapse, as in this, they may need vitrectomy or at least a good repair. So we, we just spoke that even no PLIs need a chance. So every single eye deserves a chance. Um, so mar, look at the margin, look at the canaliculus. I'm not going specifically to the canal, but is a sole canalicular injury or an associated try to repair it at the earliest put in the monocanalicular stents i think the last 33 years i've realized the oro stents especially the monocanalicular stents from oro are the best uh, earlier we were doing all kinds of gimmicks in chankanetralia doctor and ns and i we were doing so many things we tried out we imported ones they're so expensive but this has worked out very very well um so i'm not a very big fan of bicanalicular stents in the first sitting but monocanalicular, yes. So do a systemic, a systematic eye evaluation of the eye. eye. Do a B scan in relevant cases. Fundus examination will be important unless you're taking it for emergency repair because the anesthetist doesn't want a dilated pupil. And imaging, next we come to imaging of the orbit. If you suspect a deeper injury, even if these days, if there is a suspicion of brain injury, unfortunately, Unfortunately, this is defensive medicine, but we definitely need to have imaging. And many a time we realized that this imaging is done uh, mainly for the brain because that is most important in most of the multi-speciality centers. But if the, in relevant cases, when you have ruled out a brain injury, when the edema in the brain has subsided and we are mainly taking up for inocular repair, please ask for further orbital scan or good ocular imaging. MRI, if it's only soft tissue, but you're suspecting fracture, I think in the initial cases, I think CT is necessary for all. And here, 3D imaging is also needed when you're planning further repair, not just the primary repair, when we're going a step ahead and planning the further repair. Wait for the edema subside. Most of the case times you're uh, left with very this very sad statement by our colleagues, in the other specialities, we're saying that if we don't repair this patient, the patient will get discharged and go. They may not come to us. But this is really very sad. The edema has to go because you don't want 
It's such a small case, 30 ml of the orbit. You don't want to open it up, have oozing, and then, you know, further bleeding and further edema. You don't want to cause insult on an ox already existing injury, especially in blowout fracture. I think it is a must. So this is simple conservative treatment. So if in case the neurosurgeon permits, because when there's a neurosurgical evaluation, we don't want to give steroids. They try to give 3% uh, saline or they try to give mannitol, but that is not enough. Wherever there is not much of comorbidity, please talk. Please talk to the internist. Please discuss with them. And you have to start steroids there because it will also decrease the morbidity to the nerve as well. You may not start with IVMP in every case, but at least you will bring down the edema. So orbital hematoma, especially in children, it's mainly conservative. You don't have to uh, go in and do anything quickly. Blood fracture which in children behaves exactly like blood fracture, a green stick fracture in children. So you can wait. Uh, conservative treatment. See, this gentleman came only with a squint, severe diplopia. His vision was very good. He was extremely scared of a neurosurgical intervention because there was a lateral wall fracture, extremely posterior. It was impinging towards the nerve. But his vision was good. So you know that the nerve is not damaged. There's no traumatic optic neuropathy. So we gave him steroids. Um, and in case there is a, a suspicion of infection or if there is sinus hemorrhage, hemosinus, then you can give under the cover of antibiotics as well, oral steroids because he came almost about three weeks later and his squint improved. The lateral rectus edema decreased. So he did not require any treatment to remove that fragment of bone because you will realize if I try to remove this fragment of bone along with the help of neurosurgeon, the morbidity is more. Now, again, the same way, this was we thought this was unviable tissue and it is going for necrosis. The neurosurgeon said there's no, those is a superior wall fracture. There's nothing to be done from my end. We waited for, so we, we discussed, we gave him steroids, IV steroids. Uh, one week later, uh, he was, the edema had subsided. All the chemosis, which looked unviable, I would not even resected a millimeter of the tissue, subsided. Two weeks later, this was the situation. G examination was also done a week later. A month later, the child was absolutely fine with good vision. So you can use, uh, as oculoplasty surgeons, we can use collagen. Every single wound need not be repaired. You can use that primary uh, uh, preference, uh, sorry, the complete preference is for the optic nerve and for the cornea, just as it was discussed after Rupesh's talk. So, this is the important aspect, tasorephy, wherever you need to start a globe inspection. If there's no other injury, you can safely do a tasorephy and leave it in place until the wound subsides. There's no point in doing early intervention, trying to put too many grafts, trying to give five, five fluorouracil, blah, blah, whatnot. Just good, gentle wound massage because, again, we have to protect exposure. Even in patients in the ICU, please give a lot of ointment. These days, most of the ICUs uh, where I've been visiting, I, they keep antibiotic uh, ointment there by the side to prevent exposure keratopathy. Now, emphysema is a very important aspect. When the patient has that, we should instruct them not to blow the nose because we know that with the cracked bones, they can develop a pneumocephalus as in this case, this was almost one month post-injury. He had severe diplopia. He was unable to elevate his eyeball. There was a superior wall crack there. And he was going from visiting many places. One, three to four weeks down the line when the scan was repeated, a pocket of pneumocephalus. And by then, he had already had a stuffy nose. Then those who have deviation of the nasal septum, there will be turbinate hypertrophy, edema if there is hemosinus, especially not. in this case, there was no hemosinus. But they can have that. So there was a dural tear there. So in the initial cases, when the edema subsides and there is extensive dural tear or there is extensive fracture of the superior wall, an ACF, anterior cranial fossa, carpeting is needed. And here again, it is good that if we can join the neurosurgical team to help out as far as the eye is concerned. You may have to tag the superior rectus. You may have to see the, in the movement of the muscles. 
because you don't want to do as many surgeries as possible later though it's very easy to explain to the patient oh it was so bad a drama that you were your life was important this was important we'll do this queen surgery later try to finish off as many things as possible in the first sitting itself of course sometimes definitely a second or a third meeting so the dural tear was repaired in this case and the mesh no you have to be very careful the facio maxillary surgeons are very fond immediately this titanium mesh nowadays we do lot of 3d printing we do navigation surgery please realize this mesh plates screws are all a mess as when we feel your when we feel our face if i'm having screws all over here you know it's not a it's not a good feeling at all think of us as that before doing anything for the patient and um, here we did the blowout fracture was needed but he was very keen on the improvement of his appearance he came in a little late so i put in an implant first but then i realized it was no good so if there is a fracture uh, of the floor and an implant please give first importance to the fracture because you put a nice implant it is just going to sink down so here again all these bad scars were just managed with massage only massage is the key Uh, so initially you can give a steroid antibiotic then it not but you can use your plain and simple humble coconut oil works wonders uh, tripod fractures again when there is lot of anterior cranial fossa fractures again it depends upon the team some one team may mainly concentrate on the skull bones one team so if they can work together fine otherwise mainly stabilize this first before this goes so she had come down all the way with a troublesome diplopia and then the tripod fracture was corrected again all these scars managed only with massage intraciliary incision is what i like for fractures but it depends upon the surgeon's choice gives a very beautiful scar and uh, you know it's almost as if you have not operated on the fracture so blood fracture the key is mainly to when there is diplopia troublesome diplopia and you don't want enough thalamus to set in please go and do early repair uh, if uh, or at least wait for 14 days when there is it's a green stick fracture like this and the inferior rectus is incarcinated a white eye frac blood fracture in a white eye then and when there's troublesome diplopia you can go ahead within the first two days or three days or even as soon as you see the patient when there is not much edema again the key here is edema to subside and late repair is a problem because after about one or two months enophthalmus has already set in when i was in shankaraitralya i used to see many such cases but now i've got the opportunity of seeing cases much earlier so the, the, it has its own bane so here you have to co first correct the fracture then you see where, what you can do for the sulcus put in fat or uh, i don't like fat very much but maybe put in a little more med po sheets so go for something which is you know which is uh, bio compatible and uh, these meshes titanium screws plates all fine but you must make sure the oculoplasty orbit surgeon is around when they do this because we know exactly where to go what to do how to monitor the pupil etc so the i think the uh, eye surgeon or the orbit and oculoplasty surgeon is a very important person in the uh, repair of complex periorbital fractures and injuries so this and even these uh, uh, globes uh, globes which are completely luxated push them back nobody wants the eye to be, as we said discussed nobody wants enucleation he wish push them back take care of the cornea he had a bad corneal issue because of exposure keratitis because i got to see him a little later no no I, i i we did the pushing back but then you know there was the ointment and all those things were not applied maybe properly you have to meticulously go to the icu and keep seeing and talk to the surgeon then then, then the, only with conservative treatment the left eye was saved um and this was a rare case where he had a csf rhinorrhea and he was not happy he had a hemianopia in the good eye no pl in this eye and he just wanted to be removed because he was not getting job offers he was in dubai and he wanted better placement so i had to do the unfortunate task of removing this eyeball which i very very rarely did and the only good saving grace was he donated his cornea was donated for because his cornea was in excellent shape so i think teamwork is the most important point among the 10 points which i have elucidated and uh, and here her eyeball was completely luxated into the maxillary hardly any sign is there but again with step by step you don't have to jump in and do too many things you can try bit by bit and uh, 
make sure that the patient comes back on the track and comes back to some terms of uh, you know facing his or her life and this uh, luckily she also got to settle down with her family thank you very much wonderful talk dr grover sir and jayanta can comment on this thank you lakshmi all her wonderful experience brought to the fore within these 10 very important points regarding care of the adnix trauma first of all she brought about brought out the importance of the adnix trauma in terms of uh, not just protection of the globe but also in terms of a patient's uh, ability to face the world the aesthetics that we lead behind and she stressed it beautifully and all her uh, um she qualities of teaching the young were brought out to the fore in her forceful presentation jayan thank you yes sir yes sir uh yes sir ex exactly sir the nowadays in cosmetic following road traffic is one of the big issues and if we treat if we repair at the earliest that is excellent cosmetics with now recent era even there's a no such scar and lakshmi ma'am beautifully mentioned all those points all photograph very even with a very complex trauma with a team effort generally with a team effort maxillofacial surgeon ent surgeons plastic surgeon we can achieve a lot there is a lots of orbital fixers along with that next loss of this even we can take in care with the help of our colleagues so it is a basically and that's i initially mentioned that in, now it's very clear with lakshmi ma'am's talk and presentation so we can think beyond now not the ocular as our one of our um am is specific in society it is mentioned as a non only ocular it is a ophthalmic basically ophthalmic means we are dealing ophthalmology not only the ocular that is a some problem with a other specialty they refer to patient to us only when there is a globe injury so i think it emphasized very well is the importance of primary management it makes a huge difference so to have a specialist to have an oculoplastic person for repair of the eyelid injuries will prevent a lot of deformities cancer injuries preventing uh, the bad telecanthus preventing bad enophthalmos getting good aesthetic closure of the eyelids for functional and uh, for anatomical purposes for structural purposes all that is very important and canaliculus as we know can only be restored if operated within the first few days so primary trauma offers the best opportunity to give the best care to the patient and that is where the role of coordinators to bring in all sub specialties where other specialties plastic surgeons maxillofacial surgeons or neurosurgeons are needed to bring them all together to give the best possible outcomes to the patients sir yes dr shakeen so really wonderful talk by dr lakshmi it was really uh, worth uh, learning so many facts about this one point which i really wish to stress with ma'am has already uh, talked about is the extrusion of eyeball is it position of that eyeball uh, into the eye itself maybe uh, it would give us not other benefit or uh, better than the artificial shell it would give us a better cosmesis and in cases if you fix up the uh, Rightly, we would have a moments to. I have a couple of patients with me; those are doing really good after this reposition of this extruded eyeball. The second point I want to Even stress if on: the eyeball this. is pushed back into place. It is going to go for thysis because the, it has been severed from the optic exactly. nerve. But exactly. even a thysical eyeball behaves just like your implant, so you can beautifully fit a shell later on. Correct. Correctly, better it would and be. And the you... trauma of having lost the eye is really it's a great agony for both the patient, exactly. along the patient, the attenders. So you at least they'll say, "Oh, I have the eye there. In future, I may get back." Definitely, something. that that positive feeling is that, very that, important. That that that's the most important. And if we have uh, reached early to that patient, and we can really search out the muscles, and if the muscles are attached, the patient may not go into thysis. Yeah. 
and the second uh, point of which i would like to stress on is uh, all those people who are working with the trauma patients ocular trauma needs to have an exposure to all kind of sub specialities like oculoplasty squint so that they understand better uh, repair and the management immediately at the time most of our patient when they are visited icus and emergencies they are often ignored because the general surgeon or the neurosurgeon they are really not bothered about the vision or the eye many patients they would come to us or report us very late with an optic nerve injury already you know gone standard and so is the cornea gone which where you would not be able to do anything so any person maybe it's a senior person visiting icu which has to be assess the patient thoroughly and then guide the emergency staff accordingly so the better visual rehabilitation or i management is done well in time think now the corporate hospitals are rolling the roost everywhere in when we were i was in shankanetra i remember dr badrinath had insisted every day three people will be on duty for trauma cases one is a cornea surgeon one is a retina surgeon and one is a general ophthalmic surgeon and if they needed meticulous ophthalmic repair they has to call one of us but now in corporate i think we should all insist that they should have one ophthalmologist on the board for trauma cases Uh, that's what i would request dr grover if we can talk to somebody or in the center like not only the ophthalmologist it should be in a all emergencies a head injury or a facial trauma injury is to be taken care by maxillary facial neuro and ophthalmology together so that everybody you know sits together and they can decide what to do when to do that would give a better uh, you know rehabilitation to the patient thank you yeah I, i'll just button once i think in the op center we are still we are, we are having the same thing because we are we are uh, attached to aims so we have a neurosurgeon on board we have a senior like guys very, very so i think that's the right approach and as you rightly said once the edema goes the picture clear so we have there's no point in shooting in the fog you don't know where you're shooting so best is if you can let the edema and it's a fantastic talk that we am opener for everybody thank you thank you all uh, for your nice discussion now can we invite uh, dr mananjan das from arvin team to talk about corneal injuries can you share your screen please yes sir can you see the screen sir no okay we can see two guys yeah yeah, yeah. it's me <laughs> i thought you're getting diplopia yeah no no diplopia <laughs> okay yeah. Too good. I know. Rahul, can you help him to do the to to share the screen, please? Yeah. Uh, is it now seen? Not yet. Not yet. Uh, Mr. Rahul, can you help him to do the same? Yeah. 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 yes share then now i am getting open system preference no no i think you gone wrong yeah. i have clicked then then shared okay now it is asking for open system preference uh sir shall we go for the next presentation and come back because yeah. by the time I sort it out yeah uh, then there has to be zoom there has to be zoom uh, downloaded there only that would come yeah dr kokar yeah sure so can you see my slide should i go ahead uh, meron if in case yeah, uh, you want yeah, to give some time so yeah it is okay. fine i'm going to the mode now and uh, you can okay i'll just stop this from here first just give me a second and there we go it's taking time but okay okay here we go yeah so when mehul asked me to talk about the pediatric cataract i was just wondering why why me i mean he's done so many of things uh, pediatric cataract i think he's done so much of trauma work and uh, it was very nice to see the galaxy of speakers today and especially dr grover who's been all been a friend philosopher and a guide for all the ophthalmic things Yeah. Okay. So I'll be talking about the traumatic cataract. Now, traumatic cataract could be uh, more traumatic to uh, the patients because what happens, especially in the children, when the one eye got gets hurt, the child might not come and complain to the parents. 
and the vision is lost from that eye. And by the time uh, the redness, no, it's not in the, all the injuries that you'll have a redness in the eye. Some contraco injuries of the cataract in which you can have subluxation and the child will not complain because he might get a thrashing from the parents. So there are so many hidden things. So these things should be picked up as soon as possible. And whenever any child is squeezing one eye uh, in, in the sunlight, I think they should always go to an of, uh, ophthalmologist, get a refraction done, get a proper evaluation. And with that line, I think I'm going to start my talk. So as uh, Rupesh had made my life easier, I'm going to skip all these slides and I'll save some time. The only thing I'm talking about is a contour injury in which the, the force goes directly into the eye, goes hits the bone at the back and comes back. So you have a coup and a counter coup, and that can actually jolt the entire lens. A lens is what? It's basically suspended by some elastic uh, ligaments all around called zonules, and, and it can actually get dislodged and get subluxated also. So let's see what all can happen. So whenever there's an injury to the cataract, the, uh, cataract is formed only because there's an injury. It could be a metabolic uh, problem, and it can lose the transparency. That's the first thing. It can lose its position. It might get shifted, get subluxated. Or third thing we, we, we found is the volume loss. So there could be some partially absorbed cataract, like a membranous cataract, or there could be a balloonous cataract, which I'll be showing you some examples. Right. Okay. So the basic, most important thing here to know is that what you need to do is take a proper history of trauma. You have to ask him how it happened, what happened, what were you doing, where were you, and who were the people around you? Basically, it's the bystanders who are getting hurt. If you're are playing a uh, say cricket, the guy who's looking at the ball is always ready to catch the ball or duck away because he can see the ball. It's the person who's standing next to him who's not looking at what is happening around. Same is true for the for the cracker firecracker injuries, same for the gilly danda things, and same for the golf or any other injuries. So one is you have to create a scene. What is the advantage of that? You know exactly how it happened. Second is if there's something, uh, for example, in on certain road, people are hitting at one corner. So there could be a blind corner, so you can put uh, uh, lights or uh, a marking there. So you have to check a vision in the uh, for this patient in the casualty if they come with the, with the uh, early phase. Check the pupil reaction of the other eye, which was also was mentioned very well. Intraocular pressure should be seen whether the globe is open or not. Slit lamp gives you, you see hyphema, sphincter I think you all know how to check it. When you're checking the cataract, you have to see the morphology of the cat. It could be an early rosette or a late rosette. There could be zonular damages. And if the patient has come to you after three to four weeks after injury, please always do a gonioscopy. We can avoid the gonioscopy in the early first five days for secondary bleeds. Otherwise, you can do a gonioscopy. Fundus evaluation, ultrasound, must in this patient, and X-ray and CT MRI in the patient in which you think the injuries can't be explained otherwise. Okay, so these are certain examples of open inj globe injury which were repaired outside and came to us for cataract. This is one with the anterior capture also, uh, capsule open. And this one is a minimum injury on the periphery. Rest looks good. Okay, so these are the other things you should look, look for a closed globe injury. You can have a hyphema, you can have a sphincter tear and subluxations. So in the closed globe injuries, what you get is early ro rosette, which is basically fluid collection behind the anterior uh, posterior subcapsule, which is a little superficial. When it goes to deeper, it becomes a uh, deep rosette. Uh, late rosette, actually. So you, this, these are the examples of the rosette cataracts, which are routinely seen by us. But it's not always rosette. With a closed globe injury also, you can have a subluxation, and the picture could be as bad as what you see in the middle here. Okay, so subluxation can be seen, or you can see vitreous coming all over. And by and large, most of these patients will come very late to us because uh, these are unilateral injuries in children. In the adults, they come immediately, but immediately you're not supposed to do anything because there might be hyphema and things. So you have to take care of the pressure in these patients in the early phase. And this is an example of a loss of volume. This looks like a membranous cataract, which is totally absorbed. And this is what is a balloonous cataract. The volume of the, of the lens you can see is increased. And this is like a Morgagnon cataract. And this is also a closed globe injury. Now, we do UBM in all these patients. And it's a, it's a wonderful technique to check it out. And especially if it's not a closed globe or if we repaired it about a, four weeks after the repair, you can actually go and do the UBMs in all these patients. Because once the iris is stuck, the OCT might not work behind the iris. So UBM is the one in which you can actually see behind the iris very well. So you can see example of a partially absorbed cataract here, a balloonous cataract here, anterior capsule rupture with the vitreous coming into the anterior chamber. The lens subluxated all the way into the anterior and a partially absorbed cataract, only a thin membrane is left. So UBM is important for us. So what you need to do is in the opal globe, the first thing for you to do is to please go ahead and, and uh, do a repair 
to the best of your uh, uh, your, your tech, whatever you have the knowledge or you call the senior person to do it so if you do a stretch in time it will save you nine if you can do a good proper uh, suturing of the open wound without any incarceration of uvil tissue your chances of prognosis and pro vision improvement in these patient improve uh, tremendously and lens respiration may or may not be done at the same time in case you get a surgery at the odd hour in the night and you don't have machines uh, for aspiration and all you can actually stay wait there and just repair it and make the outer coat contiguous and then we can always come back later on so you move at a 4 to 6 week and then you decide after that what you want to do and if you if you can do the cataract later on and the closed loop injuries you don't have to intervene immediately until unless the pressures are very high and when you think there could be a a problem which the corneal blood staining can happen otherwise you're not supposed to be intervening early and you can keep evaluation of the posterior segment in these patients okay so the vision equity is good you don't just observe these the symptoms and manage the iops and inflammation focal opacity is and in the periphery can cause glaze myotics can be used in some patients subluxation if it's not too much there might be change in the cylindrical glasses you please change the refraction and give the glasses corneal scars you can give contactless trial in case the lens is clear Okay, now when do you intervene? Is when the visual significant cataract is seen, or there's a lens-induced glaucoma, an anterior capsule rupture, and causing increased pressure in the eye. And if you want to do a preparatory, because there's a vitreous hemorrhage along with that, and they want the lens to be out of the way, then you can just go ahead. Prognosis has to be always guarded in this patient because although it's a closed globe injury and everything is good, the back at the back you can have a commotion retina, you might have a tear in the choroid. So prognosis is always guarded. and if the vision is good in the patient patient feel happy you feel happy you don't mind be uh, wrong in your diagnosis of saying prognosis poor because if they, he gets good vision it works well but if it's other way around it does not work well so you have to have a uh, surprises can happen on the table be prepared for that you can have a cts cts protein all things have to be on the table in fact i always routinely keep iris flow in these patients these days now so this is one of the surgery i'll show you a few surgical scenarios and then i'm out of this Okay, so this is a video I show, photo showed you earlier. So there's a small open globe injury here, and it's gone through and through. Come on, come on, come on. It was working. Okay, it's gone. Come on. Are you? Where have we reached? Screen stop share window. Why? One second, huh? I'll go back to that. Just kick me out of the system. Ah, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, I think something happened on this end. Ah, uh, it's still screen sharing my screen, is it? It's gone wrong here. Yeah, screen is shared, sir. Yeah, it's, it's shared, right? No, screen is shared. Screen is shared. One second. Uh, I'll stop share and go back again. I think that's the way to go. Sorry. I think I pressed too many clicks on the. Okay, this is the one which is working. So I'll share this one. What's happened? I got two screens working now. I think so use a different desktop. Close one. I think I'm going to do that. I think what has happened is that uh, I have not been in a online mode for a long time. <laughs> I think the COVID has gone behind, so that's why the problem. So uh, where am I now? Can you see my video? No. I can see you. You can see me only. Yeah. I'll go screens again and. What has happened to the PPT is what I'm going to see. Just give me a minute. I'm really sorry for this. Oh, the PPT got closed. I don't know how. Why? Mm -hmm. oh, they were interesting videos. So sorry for this. Just give me a minute. Session, you can come back after. No, I'll do that. I'll do that. I'll do that. I'll do that. Thank you. Yeah. So, I'll stop. Class, are you ready? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Please share your screen. Yeah, sharing. Thank you. Uh, you can make out. Yeah, yeah. I think I'll get out and do it again. Okay. 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 
good morning sir so at the, at the outset i love to thank uh, the otsi and grover sir naresh sir uh, and all the senior faculties who has given me this opportunity to present my my topic today topic is principles of corneal tear repair and uh, while we this all, all of the topics uh, are relevant to each other as already sir has grover sir has told so my topic we just give a uh, who statistics so about globally 55 million of people experience serious ocular trauma every year and out of which the blindness under the age of 20 is predominantly due to ocular trauma and it has got more of socio economic in impact so these are the injuries coming back in the history of the injury is very important and the activity he or she was doing during the injury or the velocity at which the boy he hit the his eye or trauma with any vegetative or non vegetative matter all things depends upon the outcome of the surgery so to start with as soon as you receive a patient with a, in the in the emergency unit our walk up starts and walk up starts with uh, the visual acuity recording and uh, recording of the pupillary reaction if possible you can go for the strict lamp examination and fundus also sidereal sets should be looked after uh, and imaging of course uh, should begin so imaging starts with the basic uh, fundamental is with x ray to see about the uh, radio opaque uh, foreign body in and around orbit uh, and also orbital fractures next is the ct scan which is the gold standard for detection localization size shape characterization of both metallic and non metallic foreign body however the sensitivity is between 56% and 268% and it is um, easy for uh, patient with uh, open glow injury this scan adds a uh, adjuvant to the localizing the intraocular foreign body it can determine the extent of intraocular damage retinal damage and double perforation uh, and also nature of the intraocular foreign body other modalities of treatment uh, or investigations will be the ultra pen ultrasound biomicroscopy or gonioscopy if you suspect intraocular foreign body in the angle mri however should not should be avoided initial imaging of choice so pre op management begins with the injection of tetanus toxoid systemic antibiotics and then you decide whether it is conservative way of management or um, surgical management for conservative non surgical management length of the laceration should be less than 2 mm or less no intraocular tissue or foreign body in the wound no intraocular structure other ocular structure involved it should be self sealed and the four seals may be positive on um, provocation or else other contraindication being children uncooperative adults or mentally retarded patients so surgical management starts with the aim of restoration of structural integrity restoration of optical optimal visual function and prevention and management of posterior segment pathology and also prevention prevention of post traumatic complication like glaucoma Malmatis and amblyopia in children. So coming to the topic as such, the principles of corneal tear suturing starts with the very basics, and meticulous surgery is more important. And and following up this simple procedure, simple line of treatment uh, um, uh, principles makes your surgery more effective uh, and good opposition. So first is the selection of uh, suturing material. We need to have a monofilament tenon. a uh, reverse cutting saturated microsurgical needle and it should be held at the junction of 2/3 to 1/3 uh, not in the middle of the uh, needle second uh, is the type of suture which you have been using for what purpose where you do suture so cornea can be sutured with teno or levonolanone sclera can be sutured with nino or tenolanone conjunctiva with 7o 8o or 6o vicryl simple intraoperative sutures are more preferred 311 or 211 throws uh, are easy to do it and not should be buried superficial and away from the visual axis so principle 2 is the suturing so depth of suture uh, should be 80 uh, 5 to 95% depth and it should be about 1 to 2 mm of the total length in perpendicular tear just like or linear tear uh, you can see in the equal length uh, or depth of the um, depth in both sides the wound is more important just like you can see the picture a which shows the perpendicular linear tear with the good depth and and the side of 
uh, and suturing and also the not in buried place. Second, you can see the superficial uh, suturing with a gap in the inner lip. And the third, you can see uh, it, the asymmetry of both the uh, superior and uh, superior uh, suture um, coming out in a different way. So it has got a uh, overriding and also that uh, one polyp of the uh, wound is gone behind. Third, you can see similarly asymmetric suturing leading to overlapping. And fourth is the through and through sutures, which are always in need for infection traveling down. So you can see the first picture shows uh, the linear suturing and good opposition. And here second uh, picture shows the overheading. Third principle is the self for the self laceration. If you have a self laceration, the back surface uh, of the wound should be equidistant. That is, C uh, should be equal to D rather than uh, the front surface, similar tier and deeper tier uh, should be in a dissimilar way. It doesn't matter uh, the size and the outside how it looks. Rather, um, the, the deeper switches should be a more uniform. Fourth is the zone of compression. If the length of the suture and the distance between sutures uh, A or B, uh, A is the length of the suture and B is the distance between one suture to other suture. If A is more than B, then wound closure will be tighter. And if the A is or this length of the suture and the distance between the other suture is more, then there will be a wound gapping or leak. So this is how first picture shows well uh, well spaced and well uh, centered sutures with the equal length so it has got good zone of compression and it is compartment and you can see the second with the multiple sutures overriding each other so fifth principle is the suture placement strategy usually before we follow longer peripheral compressor suture to flatten the corneal periphery and, and the small short opposition sutures at the center so this is how the linear tears in the visual axis. The video uh, follows. You can see the with minimal uh, tissue handling, uh, you should start suturing from one end to other. So we started the suturing uh, of initial two or three switches to make the a uh, foam glow form and then you uh, suture according to the uh, specimen or alignment. So there are certain principles which has to be followed during suturing. This is the suturing I have shown, uh, just a ornated video uh, and the landmarks I'll be for showing you in the next video so that that should be highlighted. So this is what I was talking about when you are thinking about, about to handle a case of zigzags, lacerations, the anatomical landmarks are of more importance. So I see the laminar anatomical landmarks are the limbus or the uh, lacerous angles or the pigment lines or uh, vascularization. So this case you can see in the suturing pattern according to the anatomical landmarks. This is how we started with suturing for these um, laceration angles. So this is a full thickness tear uh, and first suture is put at the laceration angle number one and then again the another laceration angle number two. Then we go towards the uh, limbus and then adjust the suture accordingly. All the sutures has to be perpendicular and next is the corneovascular lacerations, the principal main here is to approximate the limbus first and then you finish up the closure of the primary closure should be towards the sclera and then the secondary starts from the limbus. So here you can see after the uh, dis uh, uh, meticular dissection at the limbus, then you start uh, suturing the that you will start suturing the first the first has to be done in the limbus and after that limbus sutured then we finish this scleral part and then we'll come back to the corneal part. 
So corneal again will start from one end with the limbus, then at the suture angles, uh, and then in the meantime we need to form the AC with viscoelastics uh, and then start suturing. If the lens matter is already in the wound, uh, we can aspirate as or if vitreous involved, you can do a primary anterior vitrectomy and leave the form the AC nicely. We can give intravitreal. And this is how the stellate lacerations uh, occur. Uh, and we once the presentation of stellate lacerations is seen, it is almost like a nightmare for all surgeons. Uh, so we have to identify the extent of wound and the apex of the laceration. And, and then also have to evaluate uh, the tissue loss. So upper, after the stellate mass laceration is managed, then we have to see the wound along with iris prolapse. If there is prolapsed iris, then we have to think about whether you have to repose the iris back or you have to excise it. The reposition are usually done uh, yeah, between 24 to 36 hours uh, if, yeah, and it has to be healthy. It can be also excised if the uh, wound is unhealthy along with the uh, exposure beyond 24 or 36 hours. After the treatment, then we go with the antibiotic topical and eye drops uh, or steroid medications depending upon the wound uh, and cyclopegics also added uh, along with the uh, posterior segment examination in the next day for further management. So suture removal ideally has done at the a month's time and all sutures broken or uh, loose sutures should be removed whenever they present to us during the follow-up. Sequential removal of sutures has to be practiced and that is the tight sutures has to be removed first uh, as against the loose ones when you titrate the suturing uh, and the refractive correction of spectacles uh, can be uh, given only after uh, one month of uh, suture removal. So follow uh, and counseling is of our importance in, some, in case of trauma. So prevention is always better than uh, the treatment. Uh, so protection of other eye also adds to um, the major uh, prevention um, protocol and counseling for long term uh, vision uh, outcome should be done prior to the surgery and for all medical legal purpose. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Das, for your wonderful talk. And uh, you explained very uh, great details that uh, how anybody can proceed. I think Dr. Shakin Singh can comment on this. That was really a wonderful uh, presentation again. And Dr. Sav has already covered all those points, so how to, what needle, how to handle the needle, how to put the distance and the distances from the margins. Uh, it's covered really very well and a very important part which he has already touched upon is to suture the limbus in all cases of uh, corneoscular injuries maybe the corneal lead, uh, reaching the limbus the limbus has to be secured first another important point here is when you suture the limbus uh, we need to be very careful before start suturing we need to clear the conjunctiva of the limbus so that you have a clearly exposed the scleral tissue to be sutured. Unmute, sir, please. Unmute. Uh, sir, unmute. Unmute, sir. Uh, I was uh, muted all through? Yeah. No, 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 no. Just last, yeah, we heard you. last two lines. Uh, only thing is to, uh, you know, expose the conjunctiva so that we can prevent conjunctivalization of the wound or uh, the epithelization of the anterior chamber angle, which can prevent the secondary glaucoma. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, I'll take uh, time to answer some questions from the audience. Uh, one question, uh, any, any timeline regarding surgical intervention in no PL cases? Can you answer, Paritosh? As soon as possible, I would say. Uh, as, as soon as possible, absolutely. Uh, the, uh, another uh, question uh, is uh, how uh, to manage the impacted scleral foreign body? Impacted scleral foreign body. 
uh, we will have the discussion after the foreign body talk is yes. over. I, I think yes, sir. Because we have a talk on the that. Reshma who has a talk on that, yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I now, Doctor uh, Sudarshan Kokar can. May, may I please make a comment? Is yeah. it okay? Uh, 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 it was a wonderful talk by uh, uh, Dr. Das. So uh, uh, the only other thing, especially for the postgraduates and our younger colleagues, that when you are closing the scleral wound, uh, you tend to take some kind of a horizontal mattress suture so that you are actually involuting the sclera to make it watertight. The unlike the cornea where the, the edges get hydrated whenever there's a wound, the sclera does not get so much hydrated. Okay, so uh, uh, it's very important to uh, bring back the eye pressure. It's very very important to make a really watertight scleral uh, closure, and that can be achieved by a kind of a horizontal mattress and where the uh, some bit of the sclera can even get involuted a little bit. Okay. Thank you. This will help in the subsequent uh, uh, vitreoretinal interventions that one will need to take uh, one or two weeks down the line. Okay, Dr. Sudarshan. Yeah, please. I'm sorry please. it got interrupted. So this is a surgical videos now. So I'm going to start with foot number one. Okay. Again, the problem, why it's happening? I think... Okay, so so right. Now, this is a little complicated. So the volume you see already is loss and there's a synechia. The first and the foremost thing, if you have a synechia and a membranous cataract is to create a sulcus first before you actually open the membrane. If you open the membrane, you will never be able to separate the iris from the, uh, the partially absorbed lens or the membrane at the back. So you always create the sulcus first. And then in this case, this was a pediatric case. So after doing the anterior axis, we did the posterior axis and the three-piece lens will go and you can capture it with the, both the anterior posterior capture. So, so the haptics are in the sulcus and the optic goes behind the posterior capsule so that in the periphery, the posterior capsule and the anterior capsule will join together and you'll have a, a free of VO kind of surgery in these patients. So a three-piece lens goes in and once it goes in, you can dial it in and you can tuck and do a, a capture in this one. And that's how it goes. So this is the one in which there's a, Iridodialysis along with the cataract. And this again, you can see is a membranous cataract as can be seen on the UBM here. So all these patients get a UBM come to the table. Now in this patient, we did a little trick. What we did was we put in a CTR at this stage. The good thing is that in traumatic patient, you can use a CTR much better than in, in the congenital cat, uh, subluxate cases. Because what happens in those, the zonules are weak from all along and it's a progressive disease. Whereas in the traumatic ones, the, the, the non-traumatic zonules are still working very well. So in this one, we put in a CTR now after this, under this white membrane, and it actually pushed and made a, a iris pupil for us here. And we didn't have to do a repair of the iris in this patient. So this is one of the techniques which we just sent for publication. And, and routinely in all these patients, we put in an ELU on the table and put a wide angle and get the picture of the retina. So in case there's a problem with the retina, we'll pick up and we'll tell the prognosis to the patient. And again, in this patient, a three-piece lens goes into the sulcus. And there's already a CTR which has gone partially under that white membrane you see on the left side here. And it's pushed the uh, iris outwards. Okay. So these are the fixation devices you can use, laser four clock CTR, and I think I'll just show the surgeries and then we'll get over with this one. And the basically the three four concept, if you're having a subluxation cases, because my mail was insisting on subluxation, so I thought I'll just talk about that. Now what happens in a subluxation is, is basically this. All right, so something is wrong in the system. Why it's happening? I'm sorry for that. I think. Okay. You run the video like this. Yeah, but it stopped on its own. I think I'll have to go back to that again. And directly click on the videos rather. Oh, yes, yeah, so click on yeah, the video I, here. I, I put the videos inside the PowerPoint only. So I'm going to just open the PowerPoint and go to the video straight. I'm really sorry. So uh, subluxation basically is a trampoline. So you have to make sure that the uh, trampoline like uh, effect. So your sphere capsule and tear capsule has to be stretched out before you can go. I think something wrong with my system because there's a bug in this, which the guy didn't remove. I, I'll just give me one minute. If this starts fine, otherwise I think I'll stop it. 
bad. It's a very heavy file because uh, it's incorporated into the PowerPoint. It's taking its own time. So you can have another talk and come back if you want, because otherwise, uh, okay, it's there, it's there, it's there. Just give it a second. I'm really sorry for this. I'll go to the video straight. So basically, two, three videos which gives you the concept of these surgeries. If I can just show that, I think I'll, I'll close it up after. Okay, so that's the fixation one, one, two, three, four, five. So that's what everybody knows. And how do you make a trampoline? Your trampoline has a little sh short piece in the center, elastic, and you put zonules along with that. So you're putting spring. So these are the zonules. And if you can buy the zonules from the market, you can replace it, but uh, I, I don't think you get those in the market anymore. So you have to stretch it, and so your bag has to open up. So what you need to do is open the bag. It can be done using two hooks or three hooks or four hooks, depending on the level of the subluxation and hardness of the cataract. So they will decide. So this was a softish cataract, only so two hooks are put. And by the time we removed the cortex, we realized that the bag is so lax. And then the CTR was put and this patient was operated. So right now I'm just telling you what you need to do, what you need to have on the table when you do this patient. And if you I fill up the bag, you can see that the bag is intact. So this is a, with a three and four or five, depending on the, on the amount of cataract you have. Okay. Something again is playing up. Okay. So you need to use a needle, a simple needle bend, 26 needle bend backwards with a bevel up. So what you need to do is after two, three passes, you can throw this needle and take another one because it might, it might get blunt. So what you need to do here. Something is not going Stopped well. again. Okay, mm. so now we decide to put a bag fixation at 2.5 from the limbus and iris at the at 1.5. And how do we reach that was? We did a study in which we, we measured the UBMs. We realized that the bag is well, well positioned at 2.5 and the iris in the front. So this is one of the patients which we did the iris spray and the, and the cataract surgery. So what we did here was a stock technique. I'm going to just show you one video of this and then I'll call it a day. So this UBM actually shows you, shows you where you have to actually fix your bag. The bag has to be at 1.5 millimeter. That's the time when it's the most physiological position. This video I'm going to show you and then we can stop it. Okay, good, it's working. So if you're planning a, a fixation to the sclera, you always should make a flap before because once you've done the surgery, you open the lens and taken the lens out, the eye becomes too soft to make a scleral flap. So in case you're not able to uh, use the fixation there, you can always suture it up. So this one, I opened the sclera, we did it, and then we've done a, a, a rexus in this one. Uh, this is a soft cataract. So, and when you're putting a sioni, there's what I'm doing. So what I'm doing now is in passing the needle from the outside first, coming all the way under the iris, coming over the bag and waiting there. And that's a handshake for me. So the left hand will come and I'll just pull it out onto the other side. And so the, the other one also. The cortex is still there. Once this goes into the bag, you have to make sure that the knuckle goes over the capsule and then you can suture it a little. And you can leave the suture there if you think you're, you're not tight enough, you can put uh, tighten it after putting the implant also. So once the lens goes in the center, this is how it looks like, and this patient actually got a good, very good vision post -op. Okay. Now this is a patient in which there was a total subluxation and nothing much could be done. So what we did was we went with the wire vectors, took the lens out, and after that we did a vitrectomy, removed all the vitreous from the anterior. I think all the cataract surgeons, pediatric and the traumatic ones, need to know how to handle the vitreous. And then we're putting iris claw. So these iris claw lenses we started doing for the last four years now for the pediatric age group also, and the senior ones also. And they work wonderfully well, and you can actually stick in very easily and just hardly takes uh, more than, uh, I think, 30 seconds on each side. And that's what it looks like on the table. And we can get away with that. And, uh, and if the nucleus is dropped, this is uh, from my video, is from my... Uh, colleague from the retina side, in which what you need to do is you need to go inside, do the lensectomy, eat the nucleus out. You can get all kind of funny patients. Then after this is done, and the, and the, all the retina guys are very keen on putting the SFI holes, which I normally don't uh, do much. I just do the iris claw. So the, this is a video just to complete the thing. So you can have the lens, a single piece lens in the bag. You can have a three piece in the sulcus. You can have iris claw lens, or you can have uh, uh, the SFI holes, depending on whatever your expertise level is. But uh, Unilateral aphakia is, has to be treated seriously. You can give contact lenses to this patient, but unilateral aphakes probably won't fare very well. That I'll just close my talk. And so, let's communicate to the patient, tell them that all these prognoses are very poor. 
if they get a good vision, it's always a good, good happy, happy patient and a happy doctor. And in case the vision doesn't come out well and you have missed out some finding or you have missed out the RAPD, and uh, so it's always better to cover itself. And all these, most of the patients will be uh, coming with a medical legal background. So you ensure that all your medical legal formalities are done before you actually start treating or you start treating, but at the same time, you make sure that you save yourself also. And uh, it's always better, better to save yourself before you save the patient. And thank you very much. I'm sorry for the glitches inside. Okay. Yeah, I'm done. Sorry. Yes, sir, I have a question for you, sir. Like uh, sure. most of this uh, traumatic attacks, actually, I have seen people uh, using CTRs, IG soak, all those things. But uh, unfortunately, most of them they dislocate after some time. Yeah. So my question is, why can't these people go for uh, straight away? Because there will be some pathology in the posterior. We have to treat the vitreous also. Why can't yeah. they straight away go for a lensectomy with a still fixated lens, like uh, Gabbers technique or any technique? Which is uh, maybe iris claw lens. I agree with you. See, what happens is if it's a traumatic cataract, the chances are that if it's a zonule less than four clock hours broken, then a CTR can actually give a good control. The subluxation in the long term will happen in the patient in which there's a congenital problem like a marfan or a Beals disease or, or, or one of those uh, congenital ones in which it's still a continuous process of zonules being broken down. In those ones, CTR alone is never an answer. We done, did few patients about uh, seven, eight years back, and they came back after four or five years with a lens bag and CTR all into the into the vitreous. We had to remove it. So we routinely started putting a CTS segment, sclera, switch to the sclera on both the sides, or a Sioni fixation in these ones. But in the traumatic ones, if it's less than four clock hour, a lone CTR can work wonderfully well in these patients. Or in fact, a lone segment, CTS, hemorrhage segment small, can also work very well in this one. But if the virus uh, is coming in, you have to do a vitrectomy in these patients. Sorry. Yeah, the other issue with this traumatic attract is traumatic midriasis. Yeah. So these patients will have traumatic midriasis and they don't constrict with any drugs, actually. Right. Uh, those right. people, just a point to make, we have to constrict the people only with the help of, we use the uh, vitrectomy cutter and mechanically pull the iris towards the center and uh, uh, we make it smaller. Otherwise, no drugs work in these uh, cases. And in fact, there will be some vitreous will be attached to the, what do you call, the rim of the iris in these cases. So that also prevents the constriction of the pupil. So all traumatic midriasis has to be constricted mechanically. That's what I want to. Yeah, mechanically you can do, but uh, I don't put stitches in these patients because in case there's a problem at the retina later on, they won't dilate. If you put a stitch around it, some people advocate. But if I have a big opening, I can, uh, if it's a, like a optic, it's a, a complete iridectomy, then I can just make it a small peripheral iridectomy and a pupil in the middle. But I never put a 360 degree moose around the in, in these patients. Patient. And I don't recommend that because in case you have to dilate and see the fundus, you can't do anything in these patients. You have to break the suture, cut the suture. Yeah, the better idea is the uh, uh, as we are certain, what we do is we do the lensectomy and then insert the scleral fixated lens, particularly our uh, innovative lens that is without glue and without suture. So that okay. has got a very low learning curve. I'll be showing that during our work there. We started doing the iris claw because the, the longest follow-up of iris claw was done by Simena et al. in which they followed 14 patients for 15 years, unidactyl uh, uh, pediatric traumatic cataract, and they found a good result. And this was published about, uh, I think, uh, 10 years back. So with that, we started doing the iris claw. We started with the anterior, but the, uh, after seeing that the corneal surgeon used to throw a fit like you damaging the endothelium. So we started reversing this lens and putting it behind the iris. So these are all retrofixated iris lenses, which don't even need a PI. And even if the pupil is big, you can go and tuck it up and the pupil actually becomes a little smaller at two places where you've got the hitches in these ones. Uh, sir, the, the posterior tuck is really a you know, very good alternative. Basically, it's two-point fixation. Now, Dr. Karajit has come up with a four-point fixation. That right. would uh, definitely decrease the pseudoridogenesis, which is going to, you know, have a safer cornea as compared to previous ones. So, that's a really very good option. It's more it's still better if it's a, a four-claw fixation posterior. IOM. Yeah, I just got the lens of Karanjit last week. I did two patients. I didn't want I to did. show that because it's not available to the mark in the market yet. So yeah, it is I not. Shown that. It's not yet, but it might come. It needs a little more expertise to tuck four claws. Two claws yeah, exactly. is much easier. So it will come. Once it comes, maybe next time if you call me, I will show you the four claws, maybe so, six claws. You never know. You know I have done a few a couple of cases. 
Yeah, but two clock uh, holds well, so we followed this patient for three years and they're doing pretty good actually. We did, did the uh, patients uh, were congenital muffins, so those ones we did. And if those can do well, the traumatic ones will definitely do better because. So we have patient with us with our posterior fixated lens from last 10 years, yeah. or my personal own right. patient. So we've been doing. They're doing good. good. They're good. Yeah, may I call upon Dr. Paritosh to talk about his uh, presentation? Um, at the outset, uh, I'd like to thank uh, the Ocular Trauma Society of India uh, and uh, my very mm -hmm. good uh, friend, Dr. Dr. Mehul Shah uh, and Mrs. Uh, Dr. Mrs. Uh, Shreya Shah for inviting me to make this presentation. Uh, amongst uh, the different categories of trauma, my talk will be restricted to uh, blunt trauma. Uh, contusions are bruising injuries to tissue without laceration, wherein blood vessels can be broken, but the gross tissue is not broken in its entire uh, uh, thickness. So it's a closed globe injury. Males are more prone, young more than the old, although there is a bimodal peak. Uh, blunt objects cause the largest, that is 30% of eye injuries, and the commonest objects are balls, you know, different uh, uh, the rubber balls or the tennis balls or even season balls, uh, stones, fists, then uh, the gilly of the gilly dandu, uh, which uh, small children play outdoors, um, work-related objects, lumber and weights, cords, paint balls. Those, these are those fugas which now will be in vogue uh, during Govinda and uh, during Holi season and vehicular accidents and airbags, etc. Sports injuries, including children playing, assault, occupational hazards, and vehicular accidents are the common circumstances. Uh, assault and motor vehicle injuries are usually the most uh, severe. Uh, I must mention and congratulate uh, uh, Dr. Mehul um, uh, and Shreya for the excellent work that they are doing and also the excellent records that they are keeping and uh, publishing so that we have a good database of uh, epidemiology, etiology, et cetera. Um, mechanism-wise, uh, uh, with contusion injuries, closed globe injuries, uh, it's Q, which means uh, it's a direct uh, blow uh, to the eye, a contra Q, which is a strong blow with pressure waves traveling across to other parts of the eye. Uh, so it's an indirect force or Anteroposterior compression. So you can see uh, that uh, the uh, uh, as the globe gets compressed anteroposteriorly, equatorially it expands. And when this occurs very fast, uh, problems occur with the continuity of tissues. Visual prognosis depends on the ocular structures involved, the extent and site of injury. Uh, poor visual acuity and RAPD on presentation are often, but not always predictive of poor outcome. So, uh, a coup, as I said, is a sudden brute force uh, applied and causing damage to the local site where the force has impacted. A contra coup is on the opposite side and it's caused by shock waves that traverse the eye. Uh, coup injuries are the, uh, the commotio retinae or acute retinal tears and dialysis. Uh, subacute necrotic uh, breaks that occur uh, subsequently, uh, and contra coup are Berlin's uh, macular edema. <clears throat> there have been excellent studies which have been carried out uh, by certain uh, uh, centers and certain people where uh, they have been um, uh, experimenting uh, or uh, trying to simulate different injuries on uh, cadaveric eyes. Uh, now, the anteroposterior compression, as I explained, uh, uh, the volume of the vitreous is fixed. Vitreous is relatively, um, uh, you know, it's elastic, but not very elastic. And so, when there is compression anteroposteriorly, there is expansion equatorially, or the eyeball has to rupture. Since we are talking of closed globe, it means that the uh, there is equatorial expansion, but not so much as to cause a globe rupture. But when this occurs, the vitreous uh, base starts moving, going hoary, 
and uh, certain uh, changes can occur in the vitreous base region as well as uh, uh, at its strong points of attachment, including the macula. So uh, these are some of the uh, experimental studies that uh, were done and the setup for that. Uh, so with these conclusive injuries, uh, uh, we get uh, we can get dialysis or a vitreous base avulsion bleeding into the vitreous uh, 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 retinal tears, retinal detachment, uh, edema at the macula called Berlin's edema. We're all familiar with the seven rings of blunt, blunt trauma to the eye. Uh, for this lecture, we are mainly concerned with uh, the uh, ring at the aura, where you can either get a retinal dialysis or a giant retinal tear or a tearing and detachment of the uh, of the uh, ciliary body epithelium over the pars planar. Uh, various manifestations. Uh, uh, could occur, uh, commotio retinae, Berlin's edema, retinal hemorrhages, vitreous hemorrhage, uh, retinal tears and dialysis, they all occur acutely. So do choroidal tears, uh, submacular and subfoveal hemorrhages, uh, or even choroidal effusions. Uh, some of these can also occur at a subacute uh, stage, which means vitreous hemorrhage, uh, retinal tears, can also occur a few days to a few weeks later in, a, in an eye with a lot of disturbance, particularly uh, with hemorrhage inside it. Uh, uh, and they can also occur at a late stage. Detachment uh, can either occur uh, subacute, but I mean, at an acute stage at the time of injury, but that's uh, for a closed lobe injury, it's not common. It's usually subacute. Uh, macular uh, holes. They tend to be subacute a few days later. The occasionally of the injury, uh, retinitis clopidaria uh, is uh, the full manifestation is noted uh, in that subacute stage. Choroidal effusion can occur subacutely or in the long term also, particularly if the ciliary body has been disturbed. Epiretinal membranes, macular pucker, subretinal scarring are all long term sequel. Retinal hemorrhages at the periphery are uh, because of the uh, coup uh, uh, mechanism and the immediate impact. Uh, Subretinal hemorrhages because of uh, choroidal rupture uh, can occur because of the contra coup effects uh, or also contributed by the entero posterior sudden compression and decompression. Uh, these are peripheral uh, subretinal and suprachoroidal hemorrhages because of severe injury. And this is an example of a subretinal hemorrhage very close to the macula. These would usually result in uh, extensive scarring in the subretinal space. <clears throat> Commotio retinae is retinal whitening, which occurs within hours after a severe blunt trauma. Uh, it typically affects the outer retina, the photoreceptors uh, are affected. Sometimes even the, the uh, affliction extends up to the inner retinal layers also. Uh, if the affliction is very severe, it can lead to eventual photoreceptor disintegration. Whenever the injury is very severe, the RPE is also extensively damaged. And such cases can go ahead and form necrotic holes. So there may be a role of even systemic steroids apart from intense topical steroids. My preference, if it's not a known glaucoma respond, I mean, uh, steroid responder, uh, I would prefer to use diflupredinate eye drops because they have excellent penetration and uh, can work wonders. Usually these eyes are uh, asymptomatic. And uh, uh, only if Berlin's edema occurs, then they can have uh, a lesser or greater drop in vision. Uh, if not severe, uh, retina regains normal appearance after a few weeks. Visual, visual recovery also occurs. If severe, again, at the macula, this can predispose either to macular hole formation or uh, uh, eventually to epiretinal uh, membranes and uh, macular pucker uh, or 
or it can lead to what is called a traumatic maculopathy in the long term. A differential diagnosis with such a case would be central retinal or branch retinal artery occlusion. The OCT, uh, as shown in the previous, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, in the previous slide, uh, there is increased reflectivity in the outer, and in this case, there is increased reflectivity even on the uh, inner retinal nerves. So even here, uh, if there is severe edema in the macula, it's better to start systemic steroids apart from topical steroids to reduce the risk of long-term traumatic maculopathy and hole formation, macular hole formation. Macular hole formation is the result of contracoup uh, and or additional decompression, pitorial expansion, where the vitreous is suddenly um, you know, compressed, stretched towards the equator. So it exerts a pull on the uh, macula where it's uh, relatively strongly adherent. And uh, this can, this provides the anteroposterior traction. And uh, the rest of the forces, they uh, provide sufficient damage to the outer vitreous cortex as well as the inner uh, uh, retinal layers to eventually contribute to the tangential traction leading to a eventual macular hole. Uh, these very rarely are noted to spontaneously close in children, but usually they will need vitrectomy with macular hole surgery. Sometimes we may have very large holes. Uh, those would obviously have a very guarded prognosis, visual prognosis. Though with all sorts of stuffings, we may eventually succeed in uh, shutting the hole uh, closing the hole, but uh, stuffings usually don't result in significant visual improvement. The prognosis, of course, depends on how much underlying RP damage has occurred. Retinal tears can be necrotic because of extensive commotion, for example, or they could be tractional tears, stretch tears, or dialysis or parsplena epithelial tears or giant retinal tears, the seventh ring that we saw in one of the earlier slides. Tears caused by blunt trauma nearly or near, all, almost always they occur at the time of the impact. Uh, many traumatic retinal breaks will eventually cause subsequent RD. So one must meticulously look for them and one must peck see them by laser, cryo, or diopexy. For some of our younger colleagues and the postgraduates, this is what the diopexy probe looks like. It's a uh, application of the laser through the ocular wall. And it's the infrared diode laser, which is used for this. So uh, you can see a large necrotic tear with a detachment around. So that's because of severe commotio causing photoreceptor disintegration. Muller cell damage and RPA is already damaged. So uh, the retina, uh, neurosensory retina undergoes thinning and large holes uh, happen. It's uh, something similar to if we were to put a newspaper and immerse it in a bucket of water and then just take it out and touch it, you know, you'll just literally create holes by just uh, touching the newspaper. So that's how the retina becomes because of severe. Uh, uh, edema or severe damage. Uh, tractional tears are again uh, because of the strong, fast uh, anteroposterior compression causing equatorial stretching and pushing the uh, vitreous base backwards. Uh, so, uh, again, as I mentioned, these need to be detected uh, and treated at the earliest before a detachment occurs. Uh, Dr. Scott had an alternative mechanism explanation, but more or less it all boils down to the same thing. Uh, tears, um, uh, um, typically uh, most of them, they occur at the anterior, uh, middle or posterior margins of the vitreous base or close to it. And they are commoner in the inferotemporal quadrant. Next is superotemporal and next is the supernasal quadrant. The superonasal quadrant tears are the ones which are missed out uh, typically across various studies and should not be missed. So one needs to look very carefully there. Uh, we've already discussed about the mechanism of uh, dialysis. 
so here uh, there is a, a giant retinal tear. Luckily, we happened to catch it at a time when uh, uh, the retina was still attached. So I was able to laser it out. It's very important to a laser well beyond the edges and the ends of the giant retinal tear. Uh, vitreous base avulsion is just separation of the vitreous base uh, without tearing the pars plana epithelium or the underlying uh, retina. And this uh, uh, portion which gets avulsed is attached to the remaining vitreous cortex. So it it's visible as some kind of a shoestring or a line uh, uh, in the fundus periphery. Uh, the importance is uh, twofold. One is like any eye with trauma, it needs to be watched carefully, lifelong for development of uh, tears and other detachment and other complications. And most important is its medical legal importance uh, and that Whenever you see this kind of a situation, uh, it's pathognomonic of blunt trauma and is of, often of considerable medical legal importance. Uh, stretch tears, again, the mechanism is uh, anteroposterior compression. They tend to occur more posteriorly um, and are curvilinear. Now, uh, all of them do not necessarily remain open. Uh, sometimes uh, Dr. Paritos, please yes. conclude. Okay. Vitreous hemorrhage could be because of uh, um, uh, retinal tear, ciliary body rupture, or acute PVD. Uh, beware of occult globe rupture in such cases. Um, follow, follow up these cases uh, meticulously. Uh, uh, detachments due to trauma, if you know they, if detected in time. Uh, they do not so much progress to PVR. Buckling is often the treatment of choice, except if there is a, a giant retinal tear with detachment. Now, here's an example of a patient uh, for, uh, with a traumatic inferior detachment and with good uh, uh, attachment with only buckling. Uh, uh, this is because of secondary vasculitis, which was because of uh, tuberculosis later. Uh, these are examples of choroidal rupture, which are around, you know, curvilinear and um, along with the shape of the uh, periphery or peripapillary, along with the shape of the optic nerve. We need to watch these, particularly for later development of choroidal neovascularization. So, uh, all of these patients, uh, I will skip retinitis uh, sclopitaria. And uh, all these patients must be uh, ingrained with the warning symptoms, namely sudden onset of new floaters, increase in number or size of floaters, shower or fountain of red, brown or black dots, flashes of light like lightning. Uh, Amsler's test is compulsory and appropriate, properly fitted, task specific eye protection. You know, once bitten, twice shy should be the motto and periodic meticulous follow-up lifelong. Thank you very much. Thank you for your complete coverage. I think uh, Dr. Naresh Babu can comment on this. On this. Uh, actually, uh, many a times, uh, small foreign body or a penetrating injury carries a better prognosis than uh, closed lobe injury because in closed lobe injury, most of the time we'll be having a severe Berlin's edema that most of the time leads to poor visual outcome. And all the cases of blunt trauma, I think uh, people should go for a complete indirect evaluation to look for dialysis. If it is there, it can be lasered so that we can uh, prevent the uh, progress of dialysis into rectal detachment. But as such, and uh, another thing is in blunt trauma, the main problem is uh, the traumatic metriasis and the dislocation of the lens, which has already been discussed. Uh, and the choroidal tear has to be watched because we can have CNVM from the choroidal tear happening maybe around uh, six or eight months from the time of injury. So, to you, sir. Uh, thank you, Dr. Naresh Babu. Uh, yeah. Uh, Maybe visible. My slides are visible. Yes, sir. Yeah, we're uh, talking Dr. about. Mahal? Yeah. 
Can can I comment? Yeah. There was a really wonderful presentation by Dr. Paritosh. Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, in regards to blunt trauma, I would like to share one uh, a few of my very rare uh, patient presenting with the blunt injury and later down to some other outcomes. One of those patients was uh, inferior. Uh, a lady was supposed to be sitting into the car, and she got hit by the window on the maxillary area. And when she reported to us, there was a you know diplopia. So she had an inferior rectus distensation. Subsequently, second day, she was, uh, you know, when re-examined, developed into an optic neuropathy. Another patient with a blood injury, a compressive post to the orbit, came out with an extrusion eyeball. Those are the really rare, rare patients uh, with the blunt trauma, which has not been reported so often, but we need to be very careful. Blunt trauma can have an extension much more beyond eyeball. Yes. Definitely. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, sir, for your comments. So we'll be qu quickly touching on the uh, devastating complication of open globe injury of like post uh, trauma endophthalmitis. It has got uh, very severe implication and a very poor visual outcome, as we know that uh, uh, the combination of uh, all mixed organism and we don't know where the organism are. Uh, incubated. The incidence of uh, endophthalmitis is wide varies between 0.9% to 17% depending upon the settings. So all factors uh, which are customized uh, according to the ocular trauma are the type of wound, type of injury, which type of open globe injury is this, settings of the injury. So we may decide on which type of mixed organism it is having, a foreign body which may be large or small, and lens abscess, and interval between injury and presentation. So according to that, we may plan the management, wound closer first, removal of foreign body if any. Presenting vision has got very important implication. Entry segment management. Securing infusion in vitreous cavity. So these are the picture of the same patient from uh, open globe injury. And uh, these are pictures of lens uh, abscess. Normally, they may be taken as a traumatic cataract and then later on we find many difficult situations like this. This patient was taken by one of our colleague, colleague as a primary repair and, and traumatic cataract. Once they started. It was such a bad end of thermitis at the end. So this is the penetrating injury, which are very serious injury. And uh, with the vegetative uh, injury, it may cause the, the exudates only in the entry, entry chamber. And this patient was through only with using the intervention in entry chamber. Here we use the anti-chamber maintainer uh, because uh, we don't know the position of the infusion cannula. We could see that the end of thermitis, then we could clear the vitre vitreous and find the normal eye. Is the then we shift it to the first plana cannula and then finish the case. This is the case with the lens abscess. There are dense exudates in whole vitreous cavity, which was cleared. And uh, with the second day implant, patient had a very good visual visual outcome. This was a pseudophagic patient had a uh, penetrating injury, and uh, so we had to manage the inter segment, clear out the media, and after managing 
we could remove all these uh, exudates and patient become very normal. Here we see interesting case, a seven year old female child presenting to presented to us with the no perception of light and the following intravitreal injection. Uh, the picture was like this. And after that, we did the vitrectomy and uh, cleared out the vitreous cavity. At the end of one month, At the end of one month, uh, child was affected and with correction, the vision was 612. And then later, we planned the scleral fixated lens. This is our own design and patented uh, scleral tuck lens. Without any suture or without glue, self-sustaining lens was placed into the At the end of uh, two months, she had a 612 vision. So this is uh, another example of foreign body. We did the vitrectomy and found this foreign body in zone two. It turned out to be 2.5 centimeter wooden foreign body. Uh, just we want we want to share our experience. With we did the study to determine the rate of endophthalmitis and study the risk factor influencing visual outcome in infective endophthalmitis following open globe injury. This was a retrospective analysis and uh, all data collected. But important is according to EVS, we started first injecting and then according to same guidelines, we taken patient for the vitrectomies. These are the results. Our code of endophthalmitis consisted of 200 eyes out of which 55% was open globe injury. We found significant improvement in vision following management. And uh, these are the demographic data. And wooden stick was the most common cause of injury on the 30 in 41% cases. And 41% uh, were the pediatric population, 0 to 18. 84% 75% uh, undergone the surgical intervention. And 59.4% uh, were the penetrating injury, mean injection were 1.35. These are the presenting uh, and the post-operative vision. And 11.7% uh, only regained more than 660 vision. And 35.7% regained more than 360 vision. And these are the, we study all these very variable. We could find that the presenting vision, corneal signs, activity during injuries, type of injury, type of intervention, pediatric population and posti segment findings. These had a significant impact on the outcome. In our study, uh, only 5.16% of open globe injury had infections. And uh, we found the corneal condition, vitreous opacity, pediatric age group at high risk of poor visual outcome and good debridement and subconjectival antibiotic injection at that time of globe closure was associated with decreased risk of developing endophthalmitis. Thank you. Thank you, Meryl. Thank you, Meryl, for such wonderful data and such a huge series, 111 cases that would be a really big series. And uh, um, you provided some valuable clues uh, about how to manage these cases and produce the best results. Can you tell us uh, why you would prefer a subconjunctival rather than an intravitreal uh, uh, at the end of the surgery? You said you would give a subconjunctival antibiotic. Uh, at that, the, irrespective of whether infection or not infection, that is the, for all open globe injury cases. Yeah, so why wouldn't you prefer a... But if the person does not have infection right at the time of repair, Normally, we don't do the intra intravitreal injection. But if patient has a endophthalmitis, then... Well, at, at intravitreal injections did cut down on... Uh, yeah. 
great friend of Thalmaitis. So, what is the opinion of Dr. Naresh Babu? Do you use them? Uh, which one, sir? Intravitreal antibodies, antibiotics at the time of uh, primary repair of. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Irrespective of infection. Yes, sir. Irrespective yes. of infection. In fact, uh, our cardiac colleague, Dr. MRD, also, after the corneal tear, we go for intravitreal injection in all these cases. Vanco and SEFTA. Especially Vanco is a very safe drug. We can inject maybe up to 6 milligram also. Very rarely we get this vasculitis. Being a safe drug, I think uh, it's better to inject, sir. Because we don't know. And the most important in all this uh, traumatic endophthalmitis which we face is not the injury per se, but the native treatment. People uh, here in our part, they use right from the extract of some green leaves to the hen's blood, uh, so many things. And that is the one which messes up the I rather than the injury per se. So right. they use all sort of local treatment. Thank you. That's valuable perspective. What was the commonest organism that you would get? Uh, you got uh, across these uh, hundred and eleven cases. We could not find any common organism uh, because uh, we don't have very good microbial support. Mostly bacillus series is the one which uh, comes in all these traumatics. Yeah, or fungi, I think, because fungi. they had a lot of uh, wooden. Oh. Dr. Sunil Marga, what should you say? Yeah, I, wanted to say I wanted to say, just add here, uh, that uh, uh, organism is sometimes be extremely important because we had a patient with orbital fracture and we had uh, put in a plate there. So I'm talking in terms of uh, orbital cellulitis. Uh, similarly, endophthalmitis also it might be important. So, uh, in the orbital cellulitis, the uh, organism we found was Borrelia burgdorferi, which is which is a very uh, uh, non-specific organism, and we thought it was just a uh, contaminant. But uh, this is what uh, uh, nowadays we know is called as orbital meliodiosis. You know, these orbital meliodiosis can sometimes be uh, endophthalmic and endophthalmic meliodiosis also. And uh, the most common thing uh, that we need to take care of is you take care of anything that is necrotic there and you take it out and the organism uh, uh, disappears. So we had a patient in whom we had an orbital fracture. The patient came to us with uh, recurrent orbital cellulitis. The implant removed, came with recurrent cellulitis eight times. And uh, eventually we just took out a necrotic bone and the whole uh, thing got better. So the knowing the organism is probably an uh, extremely important thing. Thank you, Sunil. Looking for I must just add that uh, Dr. Mehul and Shreya, they are working in uh, a very remote part. In fact, that they have been able to do so much and such wonderful things. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it's literally uh, in wilderness that they have created their wonderful institution and uh, work. Uh, work that they are doing against all odds. So I think, uh, yes, I would agree. Yes, microbiological support would be difficult in that region. Uh, we'll move to the next speaker, please. Uh, Dr. Sunil Moregar. Can you share your screen, please? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Can I go ahead? Go ahead. Okay. So uh, I, I thank the organizers, uh, OTSI, uh, uh, as well as uh, more importantly, uh, Dr. Mehul and as Dr. Paricho said, uh, he's somebody who's known uh, even at Harvard. So I'd gone to Harvard and uh, they, uh, Dr. Aaron Fay told me that I think the place that does very good work is in Dahod. And uh, till that time, I was not aware of uh, Dahod. So uh, thanks to him also. And uh, keeping in mind our recent success uh, uh, in terms of uh, what we achieved after failure at the moon. And uh, so I would uh, take that as a, a, a starting point. Uh, never give up. That's uh, that's what uh, Dr. Mehul told me uh, to talk about. And uh, he said nothing is impossible. And so uh, uh, this is something uh, uh, which I take from uh, Dr. Mehul. Uh, I see many of his cases is never given up. And so Chandrayaan 3 as a success uh, uh, as opposed to Chandrayaan 2. And so uh, Optic now uh, 2023 as opposed to what uh, I used to do uh, uh, four or five years back. So even last year, uh, some of the slides are common from last year. 
but i will uh, uh, quickly run through this presentation wherever the common slides are there from last year so this this is from uh, six hospitals across mumbai and navi mumbai i will not uh, talk about the objectives here but the main two objectives which will be important is two safety features uh, again for a safe landing in uh, an implant in the orbit uh, not be a moon orbit but uh, uh, the um, ophthalmic orbit to avoid a optic no crush not a crash so that is something that i will be talking about as an additional thing today um, uh, history we know that transcranial deroofing has been done uh, since quite some time we now also know that endoscopic is also available there are various syndromes that one needs to keep in uh, mind when uh, we are looking at the optic nerve injury or uh, how it is being injured either directly or indirectly as a traumatic optic neuropathy or as a part of uh, another syndrome like an orbital fissure or a apex syndrome of or sheer uh, raised uh, intraorbital uh, pressure and uh, as you have seen in one of our case a carotid cavernous fistula causing a uh, issue there the rational for treatment so uh, just a single line about the pathophysiology we want to understand that it is about uh, optic ischemia and edema so we need to treat that and as a rational we want to reduce the swelling and that's why we use steroids the indications for uh, optic no decompression uh, because that is something that i'm going to talk about when the visual acuity does not improve despite 24 to 48 hours of uh, steroid uh, but the the issue with steroid in the crash uh, study Uh, we do do realize that most of these patients are polytrauma, and then uh, besides the optic neuropathy, there might be other uh, conditions in the patient in terms of head injury, which may not allow us to use a steroid. And that is why we need to think more in terms of a, a surgical approach. Uh, the steroid could also have other issues like uh, gastric ulcers or osteoporosis in a patient who's an old, and uh, that's why he got the fracture in the first place. and uh, um, uh, a randomized control uh, trial showed that uh, we might have a higher risk risk of death in uh, patients with given steroids uh, this these are the number of uh, studies which are done uh, about steroids they are extensive uh, uh, the presentation is available online uh, through the ais so people can go through this pause the video at that particular time but i will tell you what something that i am doing differently now we look at color vision and we look at subtle optic nerve injury in terms of uh, inside color abnormalities and these are the charts we are using which are uh, very recent charts uh, which are available as apps so you see this as a uh, abnormality and then you see you see a very subtle abnormality at the bottom corner uh, right bottom corner and that subtle abnormality and we have treated the patient and gets a little better so uh, uh, corrected ab uh, abnormality and it, it tells us this one was treated only with steroids you also do imaging uh, uh, dtmri is something that uh, we have started using Uh, obviously a uh, visual evoke potential is something that needs to be done but then a uh, word of caution here everywhere in literature they say that if you have a flat vep you do not do anything further for this patient this is a lost patient but we have uh, uh, at least uh, uh, a dozen patients uh, which we are in uh, uh, the process of compiling where in spite of a flat uh, vep we have recovered vision the vision may not be 6 6 but the patient is recovered to finger counting Four feet or five feet, which obviously helps them in uh, driving a car. Fundus picture for documentation is important. OCT damage is something that uh, you need to see uh, uh, by a prior OCT for probably medical legal purposes. Uh, uh, sometimes you see an edema in the uh, OCT, and that tells you that uh, there is an optic nerve uh, swelling which is there, and this needs to be reduced. Uh, we now know that you have automatic uh, optic nerve assessments on uh, sonography, B mode. and uh, the closed protocol uh, is also used for uh, color doppler to figure out whether this patient has an optic nerve supply or not and whether it is compromised and whether you want to uh, do something about it uh, the ultrasound doppler factors are uh, a reduction of the peak systolic velocity and diastolic uh, velocity and average time so we have uh, spoken about another thing that is called as a uh, electronic uh, stethoscope orbital auscultation uh, when we don't have a doppler Uh, uh this is uh, my optometrist uh, doing it on my own eye and you can see the ipad there bottom which shows the um, phonogram uh, and uh, you see this is a patient who came to me with a, a optic nerve injury indirect traumatic optic neuropathy and that is a phonograph on the left side which shows that uh, absence of any uh, uh, phonographic uh, uh, sound of uh, blood flow and immediate post op with the uh, surgical correction the blood flow started uh we now also do uh, uh, 3d uh, uh, reconstructions and uh, explain to the patient this is something that we talk about uh, uh, safe landing when uh, we are putting in an implant there we tell the patient that we are not going to go up to the optic nerve 
and this implant uh, uh, will uh, never touch there and we might get a little less correction but uh, optic nerve is something that you need to save and you can do that with a, a, a navigation interop also 3d modeling is another uh, thing that we do uh, and uh, there are two uh, softwares vitria and dextros and uh, 3d prints of implants so that they do not touch the optic nerve <coughs> Uh, I'll rush through this and this is uh, one of our uh, uh, implants that we have put. You see the floor has been covered but make sure that the optic nerve is not touched. So that's the safe uh, landing that I'm going to, uh, that I was talking about. Do not go near the optic nerve and make your 3D customized implant in such a way that uh, it doesn't touch the optic nerve. Sometimes you may not uh, be able to not touch the optic nerve. So you might put in multiple screws like Dr. Lakshmi Mahesh was saying that you might feel a little bad but if the optic nerve is going to get compromised, I will not put in a mesh and I will rather put multiple screws. <clears throat> you you also get 3D models of the uh, arterial, this thing there. And uh, in one of our patients, we realized that the 3D model is showing a keratico-cavernous fistula of an indirect type, which is something that got missed otherwise. This has also been reported in literature uh, in the past, and we were not aware of it unless we really saw a patient of ourselves. We have now started to use uh, artificial intelligence, which we have spoken about at the All India. And uh, this is something that was uh, begin from 2019. Uh, of, I have done my... Uh, uh, courses on Wolfram language and we got the uh, best paper award also for the Wolfram language intelligence in uh, neuro ophthalmology and uh, the Wolfram language is very simple uh, it, it is uh, um, a little uh, one step better than chat GPT so chat GPT is a more recent thing and chat GPT according to me is not very uh, um, um, accurate and uh, it is something that uh, I really wouldn't uh, I'll, I'll talk about uh, as something which we I, I see a future in. So when you do all of this and you know that you need a surgical correction because your surgical correction, though I say don't give up and never give up, even with no PL, even with no VP, there are certain things that you need to keep in mind that all these investigations that I said have to be uh, uh, sensibly telling you that you need to do correction. Otherwise, you will end up paying uh, a pay, patient paying unnecessarily. And uh, then uh, the allegations would be that uh, I was operated just uh, for money. So once your investigations show and your AI shows that there is going to be a possibility, a very high possibility, a 95% chance that this patient is going to see, then this is a surgical review. Now in uh, surgery, we talk about, talk about surgical uh, 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 endoscopic uh, surgery. I'm not going to go into uh, the details of this. Uh, this is what we do there. Uh, that's a 30-second 30, 30 video. Uh, you do a turbinectomy endoscopy much 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 better but i'll show you also cases in which you may not be able to uh, do endoscopy uh, so you might have to do an intra orbital endoscopy so you might have to put in the scope uh, uh, through the orbit if there is a blowout fracture there and the optic nerve can be reached through there and uh, uh, sometimes you might need to take the help of the uh, 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 neurosurgeon and do a transcranial or uh, the thing but most of the time now it has uh, been seen that uh, even the um, uh, neurosurgeons uh, ask to uh, uh, the ophthalmologist to come in there and identify the optic nerve and also tell us the, uh, what what place and where we want to do the uh, decompression. This one is the actual uh, uh, fractured uh, segment uh, seen endoscopically. Which this is the only way you can actually, under direct visualization, see it much better with a wider view and, and something that uh, probably cannot be achieved by an external uh, approach. So you see that there is a fracture and that fracture fragment is pushed away from the optic nerve. So what is below the spatula is the optic nerve. This is the optic nerve below the spatula and the fragment is pushed away. The uh, conventional thing was poor prognosis. There is a perception, absence of perception of light. There are multiple fractures which are impinging on it and uh, steroids have been given after five days and no improvement uh, uh, beyond 28 hours. But I will come to more recent literature which is available and most of our studies. Uh, very serious uh, degloving injury. The, the whole people, everybody was concentrating on the uh, left side, but there was a traumatic optic neuropathy on the right side, which got missed. So this is something that I wanted to say. Multiple foreign bodies, one of the foreign bodies impinging on the uh, optic now. Uh, some places there is no role for endoscopy, no role for uh, anything to be done. And this is where the uh, uh, neurosurgeon called us in and said that I am going and doing the uh, 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 bone part of it you will have to come in for the orbit part of it. And you see there are multiple sheets which are kept there. So the most important thing here is that there are multiple sheets on the roof, on the floor, everywhere, but nothing touching the optic nerve. So that is the role of an ophthalmologist uh, during even a very complicated neurosurgical procedure like this. We have gone and made sure that there is nothing that touches the uh, optic nerve. 
sometimes you have uh, multiple uh, things involved. So here it was a lateral rectus, and very very obvious that the lateral rectus alone is in, and then that is glaring, and it uh, on the CT scan it looks like there's only the lateral rectus which is uh, uh, involved. But you can see that there's a bony impingement even on the uh, optic nerve, and uh, both of these things were corrected in the same setting. Uh, sometimes you may uh, have to do, this is what I was talking about, the blowout is so huge that you may not have any access through the endoscope from the sinus, so you'll have to do an endoscopy from the orbit. Sometimes you don't want to get those fracture fragments closer together, leave them apart, so that there is a space which is available uh, for the optic nerve to breathe, you are not strangulating by putting it, so you keep your screws more apart by putting it a split. And sometimes you just move a bony chip away, Hypoglobus needs to be corrected because your optic nerve gets pulled in such cases. Uh, this is just recently, we have done two days back, uh, a very severe hypoglobus and uh, injury there. And you just pull the uh, uh, eyeball up and the optic nerve uh, and the vision is uh, stabilized. So you don't really need to do anything for that. It's just that a stretched, the optic nerve is stretched and that, and that gets corrected. Uh, this is another patient uh, in whom uh, the hypoglobus and the, uh, you can see the hypoglobus, huge hypoglobus. Uh, the orbit is increased uh, uh, and uh, superiorly, inferiorly. And uh, here, this is one page, patient where you put multiple screws. Uh, the optic nerve is very severely uh, uh, crowded at that point. So you will not put a mesh in here. I would rather put in multiple screws and plates and uh, maintain the orbit and the other uh, uh, fractures rather than put in a mesh because this will definitely need to lead to a iatrogenic optic nerve injury if I try to put in a mesh here. Complications are known, uh, like in any uh, surgery, uh, uh, anterior murder artery, CSF leaks, meningitis, pneumoencephalus. So that's why keeping a neurosurgeon along is very important. The current evidence, I will just rush through the evidence. Uh, we, everybody knows the Boston Protocol. Uh, literature evidence, everybody talks about uh, and uh, traumatic, uh, everybody talks only about uh, uh, steroid. And a lot of patients have not been uh, offered a surgery and they come to me, even after four months, they have come to me and we have uh, attempted a surgical correction and uh, it is surprising that people have recovered even after four months. So that is that is the reason why uh, I, I thank uh, Dr. Mehul for telling me to talk about this. Uh, uh, this is the literature evidence where endoscopy is uh, superior to open. Uh, you have to look for uh, beta transferrin, obviously. And uh, these are the uh, recent, uh, this thing, this is a, a comparative study of 685 cases. That is huge amount of cases. And this is uh, talking about a surgical group having a better, uh, this thing in the NLP, no light perception. So no light perception and let go, is something that I will never tell a patient because I will say, okay, let me assess, let me put you to AI, OCT, Doppler, phonography. Everything and then I will figure out whether uh, uh, there is a uh, uh, option or not. Uh, there are new things which are coming through uh, new updates: uh, crystallins, glutamate, and uh, agonist uh, um, uh, stem cells. This is something that has come up. Uh, um, uh, timing factor that less than uh, six hours, eighty-five percent up to twenty-four hours, uh, twenty-four weeks favorable result. Twenty-four weeks that is huge. This is in contrast with the uh, Kanavari study restricting it up to twenty weeks. So I have done and uh, operated on patients at five months and I have uh, this thing. Everybody is uh, free to come over to my place and see those patients. But what is important to understand is a second nerve injury. If you have got an injury in the past and you've got a second nerve injury, these cases are definitely and definitely hopeless. Uh, newer drugs in the pipeline, mouse models. There are uh, uh, Arginus 2. Uh, gene therapy is in the pipeline. There are huge number of evidences about uh, gene therapy. And uh, uh, depending on the site of injury and the timing, there are various uh, treatments available. But uh, even when you're correcting an optic, uh, uh, an orbital fracture, you need to uh, keep in mind the three third part of the crash. You will be operating on this kind of a lateral uh, rectus, a lateral uh, wall fracture, which is pushing into the orbit and will cause an uh, uh, optic nerve uh, compromise. Whereas uh, uh, the other one, the one which is going out, you definitely don't want to push it in. In conclusion, sometimes miracles do happen. So never give up if the data, never give up if the data suggests that. So I will not go by objectivity. I will go by, sub, uh, not go by subjectivity. I'll go by objective multiple data. And if it is suggesting and my AI is telling me that, yes, go ahead and do it. I, I have been proven wrong with all my years of experience in uh, 12 hospitals and uh, 30 years of doing optic now. And I realized that my uh, artificial intelligence is definitely, definitely, definitely far, far, far superior than me because it collimates the data of many people's many years of experiences. So uh, that is important. Endoscopy is particularly useful and video audit gives you much more information. So when you're operating, when I'm operating, I make sure that every surgery is recorded. Everything is recorded. In one case in which I got a bleeding, 
there was a video in which i had got a bleeding and i thought there's going to be a retro orbital uh, 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 hematoma or retrobulbar hemorrhage and uh, this patient is definitely going to do bad he said he he did very well and we saw that the nick which we had made and a little uh, blood sipped into the nick there and uh, we looked at the uh, optic now and we realized that uh, we probably got in some uh, peripheral uh, 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 blood uh, stem cells in there and the optic now grew much faster than uh, regenerated much faster than what I had expected. I told the patient, you will see at least at six months or something like that. And the patient started seeing in two weeks. So probably what happens there, video audit will give you, this is just a hypothesis, uh, but there are lots of uh, papers available which talk about peripheral blood and uh, stem cells, which may be uh, optic now regenerated. Uh, uh, this is, this is uh, uh, once again, I'll put the Chandrayaan 3 there and I'll write it in red bold letters, never give up. Chandrayaan 2, given up. If we had given up, we would not be on the moon. Let's get onto the moon. Let's get the patient onto the moon. The feeling of being on the moon comes in. When you properly assess, put in your data, not just send another five spacecraft without uh, 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 new modification. More sensors, more data. And this time what we had achieved was we had allowed the Chandrayaan-3 to automatically land by making its own decision, not force a decision on the mission. So... In a way, there was certain amount of input and automatic decision based on what may be called an artificial intelligence. So, please, uh, uh, I would suggest that uh, let's not uh, uh, discourage patients. Uh, uh, neither do we encourage patients. No, no, we don't tell them that ho jayega, chalo kar lete hai. We look at it from a data point of view. Uh, that, that's my uh, uh, email address and my phone numbers. Anybody wants to see any of those patients or meet any of those patients, some of these patients are so eager to talk to other patients and tell them that, uh, look, I, I, I was given up. And uh, uh, it's like two years and I've done it. So 24 weeks is what I would say, definitely try. 10 days is what was traditional, uh, this thing. 10 days, you give them a very good uh, prognosis. You tell that there's a very good chance. 24 weeks, you give them a little uh, 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 guarded thing. Anything more than 24, you may say it will not work, but uh, I think I would look at data. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mehul. For, uh, thank you uh, for giving, uh, Sunil, for giving that um, hope to patients who are otherwise considered as uh, without hope. Traditionally, uh, the interventions have been limited to those cases where you can show a direct bony compression and the the classic cases of compressive optic neuropathy have a very poor prognosis if they have no perception of light. So what would you say in the classic optic neuropathy are the cases where you would go ahead because, uh, with an intervention? Uh, because well, my, my thing is, uh, I, I go to Love and Bailey, my surgical uh, training in... Uh, any cases have you done so far and uh, so what? We, is we have a database of... Uh, 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 82 cases so far, uh, out of which uh, uh, 82 is much less compared to the 685 those guys have done. But they have demonstrated no PL uh, coming back to some vision, uh, finger counting or something. Else. So we have out of the 82 cases that we have, and we have very carefully selected only when the AI has told us, we have failures in 18 cases. Now 18 is a very big number. But the uh, uh, and the, the rest of the cases where I'm seeing uh, uh, visual recovery, it is not 6 6, it is not uh, 6 24, it is finger counting up to 8 feet or 10 feet. There are a couple of patients who have come to 6 9, so there are only one or two patients. So I tell very clearly that the, the, the data has to show it. So if I if if uh, so, I'll go back to my love and belly and I will look at uh, uh, people used to say that if there is a strangulated hernia, you cut it out and throw it out. But then we were taught that look at whether there is pulsation, look at whether there is uh, uh, bleeding on touch, look at whether the tissue is viable. So I will look at multiple things like the phonogram. I put the stethoscope there and I see certain amount of... So if it was flat in the phonogram, if it is flat in the VP, if it is no PL, there is no uh, uh, reaction of light. There are multiple factors which are telling me that this is not going to work. Then I am definitely not going to work it. But at the Thank end of it, I will still put it on the AI. Thank you. So we look forward to the next talk by Dr. Naresh Babu, an excellent surgeon. I hugely respected for his high volume, excellent quality work and is a great teacher. Thank you, Dr. Naresh Babu.
we can't hear you your are you, is your voice muted you are okay yeah, yeah. no no yes yes so we'll be discussing basically the localization of the intraocular foreign body and their retrieval it's a long topic but we'll try to restrict it to 10 minutes as per as possible so uh, most of the things i'll be so in case of any open globe injury we have got three windows the basically uh, the first window is an acute window which is less than 24 hours where we will be basically restoring the integrity of the eye i mean uh, the eyeball and we want to avoid the infection and in the next two basically in case of subacute and the chronic uh, uh, windows will they will present with sequelae to us and usually the vr surgeon's uh, intervention is needed in these cases <coughs> so most of our cases will come in the first window even the foreign body but if they come in the second and the third window especially the third window they come with the sequelae mostly the cirrhosis bulbi and we have got one of the largest series of cirrhosis in our uh, uh, institute and uh, before starting examining the patient with open globe injury we should uh, ensure the systemic stability of the patient but fortunately being an isolated eye hospital we get most of the time the eye injuries and maybe in a multi specialty hospital people can come with a blast injury where they'll be having all the adnexal injury and the rest of the i mean uh, systemic illness where uh, the stability of the uh, patient may be uh not that good and a very meticulous history taking is important especially in case of the foreign bodies because the history is sometimes deceiving we'll see one of the cases subsequently and periocular trauma has to be assessed mostly the orbital wall lid etc and uh, we have to give the tt and shield for protection and all of our uh, trauma cases uh, uh, except for small foreign bodies all of our trauma cases when we take we mostly take under the general anesthesia because we don't know how long we'll be operating on these cases so this was uh, the case uh, which i was talking about the history uh there was only a very subtle subconjunctural hemorrhage but when we asked the patient said that he was uh, hit by a flying object and immediately when the pupil pupil was dilated and uh, seen we can see a foreign body inside and localizing the foreign body the by indirect ophthalmoscopy is the best way of localizing so when a patient comes to us before the vision uh, visibility of the fundus is obscured by the vitreous hemorrhage we have to dilate the pupil well and look for the foreign body and once we like localize the foreign body then retrieval becomes very easy <clears throat> and uh, all this uh, trauma cases should be counseled in group uh, in fact i call the parents or maybe uh, two or three people because we cannot uh, answer the questions of each and every people uh, individually and i am most of the time brutal in the sense i don't give good prognosis in most of these cases i tell them that it may require three or more surgeries also and uh, we have to be very frank about uh, the chances of thysis as well as the uh, prognosis poor prognosis in these cases so we have got lot of modalities for mlc purpose x ray orbit is very 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 important because uh, even if we do ultrasound and um, uh, ct scan in the court of law most of the time they ask for uh, intraocular uh, i mean uh, x ray of the patient and usually we have to do a um, pa view of these patients because uh, APV will be having <coughs> most of the time the bony shadows which will be obscuring the uh, visibility of the foreign body so the most important thing is uh, the history so this uh, patient came with multiple uh, hypodermic needle in his eye and when we asked for his x ray this was the x ray which was taken some 2 3 months earlier elsewhere and then we did a repeat x ray in our place we could find more than 60 needles in his eye and when you know, we sent him for a ct scan this was the 3d picture which was created we could find more than 60 or 65 needles so this patient was depressed and so he was breaking the hypodermic insulin needle which his father was using and he was inserting in his left eye you can make out this patient is a right handed person so all the foreign bodies were in the uh, left eye so in this case we have removed the uh, pins but still he could not uh, get the vision back so history is very important in local i mean identifying the nature of the foreign body in these cases and also uh, the type of foreign body which we can get in this uh, eyes mm -hmm. uh, the next one is x ray as i have told x ray is very very important because uh, for the medical legal purpose even if it's a blunt injury taking an x ray for just 150 rupees uh, pa view is uh, not a bad idea because uh, we most of the time can you know, find the metallic foreign bodies in these cases and in case of a plain pa view we can uh, have a 
a chance of almost 40 to 60 percent of detecting a foreign, bo I mean foreign body. But in case if it's a, for a glass foreign body, it cannot be detected in uh, X-ray because uh, the, the silica content may be poor. If the silica content is very high, then we can have a foreign body. And uh, if we don't have the facility for other things, we can use the Flaringa string. This is a case with the foreign body in the right eye you can make out. And we used a Flaringa ring. We can use a coin also, and we can uh, create an artificial eye with this, and we can identify whether the foreign body is inside the eye or outside the eyeball because this helped in one of these cases. So we can find this tiny foreign bodies inside the eye. So we, this patient came with a baldness when he was hitting a bicycle, baldness entered his eye. But in the lateral view of this patient, we cannot find the foreign body. It was quite posterior. Then we did a CT scan of this case and we can find the foreign body localized in the front, front lobe of the brain and nothing was done to this case. So history is also important and flooding a ring helps in finding. Ultrasound is very important because it uh, gives, uh, it is non-invasive and it gives a collateral damage like uh, which is happening due to trauma in, uh, in uh, these eyes like a vitreous hemorrhage, a rectal detachment, a choroidal detachment, or hemorrhage or the status of the lens capsule. So it's better to do but uh, force should not be used uh, in these cases uh, because there will be uh, uh, the risk of expulsion of the content from the eyeball. And uh, this is also very useful in exactly localizing the foreign body. And we can differentiate between a stone and uh, what you call the uh, metallic foreign body. Usually the metallic foreign body will be having a very nice after shadow, which will not be seen in stone foreign body. And stone being an inert, sometimes if the media is clear, we can still leave it actually without retrieving. And glass foreign body, I never touch because uh, uh, the collateral damage when we are uh, removing the glass foreign body is more than the damage caused by the foreign body per se. So we usually bury it somewhere else and leave it. CT scan is a very important, uh, uh, what you call the investigation modality in foreign body. It can look, I mean, uh, locate even the smallest of the foreign body, even if it's less than 0 0.06 cubic millimeter, we can locate it. And it's quite sensitive and very precise. So wherever you cannot localize the foreign body, go for a CT scan can and uh, localizing it is very good. MRI, if it is a metallic foreign body, first thing should not be done is uh, MRI because of the magnetic property. It can move almost 7 to 8 millimeters of procural space or more than 10 millimeters in vitreous, thereby damaging the structures. So once we rule out metallic, then we can go for the um, what you call uh, MRI to look for the plastic or wood or any other thing. And usually in the last two windows, especially the chronic window, we can find a lot of patients coming with cirrhosis. Usually the pu affected pupil will be dilated and dark in color. We can have this metallic ring and there can be a traumatic cataract. In all these uh, cases, we have to do an ERG. So ERG may be hypernormal in the initial phase, but uh, overall, over a period of time, the B wave amplitude reduces and uh, later on extinguishes. But even if the ERG is extinguished, don't bother, go for an EOG. In the presence of a flat ERG, if the EOG is good, still we can retrieve the foreign body and the vision can be uh, recovered. But in the presence of both flat ERG as well as the flat EOG, if the adherence ratio is very poor in such case, the prognosis is very bad. And uh, most of the time in these cases, uh, uh, the inflammation following the foreign body is uh, very intense. So it, it has to be done under the uh, steroid cover. So ERG is a must in all these chronic cases. And coming to the retrieval, the management objectives is basically to establish integrity. First uh, uh, job of us is to maintain the integrity of the eyeball. So suture all the wounds, we have to prevent the infection and then we should think of intraocular foreign body. And then our aim is to maintain a clear media in case if there is an associated retinal detachment, it has to be managed and finally the IOP control. And fellow eye should always be taken care uh, for sympathetic ophthalmia because the chances are very high in these cases. Uh, all the reactive foreign body should be immediately removed, but if it is inert, it can cause, if it is going to cause mechanical damage, then it has to be removed. And uh, the site and the location also important when you are uh, uh, timing the surgery and also the. Uh, <coughs> okay. This has been already discussed by Dr. Manavanjan. So we'll just uh, skip and we'll go to a few of these. Um, uh, videos of the foreign body retrieval. So there are many routes. It can be done to the anterior route or the posterior route or the past corner route. The first two has been abandoned now. Posterior route by using electromagnet has been abandoned because it's uh, quite damaging to the eye. Most of the time we'll be doing vitrectomy. 
And if the foreign body is uh, less than four millimeter, I'll be using, uh, I mean, uh, the transclerally, I'll be removing the foreign body, but it's more than four millimeter. We usually use it transpupillary and by, by making a limbal in, uh, what do you call it, incision, we'll be removing through the anterior root. Because more than four millimeter is not advisable to make a section in the past plana. And armamentarium is very, very important. Like we get all these sort of foreign body in our place. So we have to go with an appropriate uh, instrument to remove the foreign body. So this is a, a intraocular radath magnet, which can pick all the foreign bodies. But quite, provided it's quite tiny, it can be brought up to the sclera, then can be retried with the forceps or an electromagnet. And we have got foreign body um, the forceps like this. And this one is developed by our, uh, uh, this thing, Bapai, which is a modified Dormia's basket, useful in uh, uh, taking out a regular uh, baldress or a glass foreign body. And the last one is the electromagnet, which is there with us since 1976, if I am right. This is the only longest serving uh, instrument in our hospital, which is an electromagnet, which can pick any of the foreign bodies, metallic, inside the eye. So it's a very uh, powerful one. So once it is pulsed, you can make out every other foreign body can be picked by it. So once the foreign body is picked to the uh, sclera, we remove it. So this is a case of a foreign body with a very minimal uh, changes to the lens. In these cases, we don't do anything. And because we have to remove the foreign body transclerally, we uh, make a trans, I mean, a connective peritomy in the dominant port. It's a very a tiny foreign body. As I told, we'll be using the uh, rare earth magnet, intraocular magnet, which picks the foreign body. The aligning of the uh, foreign body is very important because the long axis should be what you call uh, perpendicular to the sclera, like this. Otherwise, when it is uh, parallel to the limbus, it can come and get stuck in the sclera when we are retrieving. So once it is done, we just bring it. And if you uh, sometimes it comes through directly, or we can use a electromagnet to remove it. So, so this is another case where we can find. Uh, 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 we did all the maneuvers. I could not find the foreign body inside the eye. After the fluid air exchange also, the entire periphery was checked. No foreign body could be made out. So this was a mistake done by me because I have taken the patient without doing a CT scan only with the help of X-ray thinking that there is a foreign body uh, inside the eye. But it was not there inside. Sorry, it was a 3D video. That's why you are getting two videos. So after uh, uh, failing to find the foreign body inside the eye, what I did is uh, uh, bridal two muscles. Then with the help of, I was lucky, with the help of the rare earth magnet, we went to the scleral area. It was outside the scleral coat, we can find out. Such a large foreign body which has come out after penetrating. So this was a mistake uh, on our part because localization should have been accurate so that we could have planned without entering the eye in this case. So this was a child playing with this chain. We can make out one end of the chain enter the father of a father's eye. And when we went inside, uh, this was uh, a brass foreign body. So there was severe, uh, uh, what do you call, reaction to this. And this is the other end of the chain connector, which was retrieved with the help of a uh, uh, vectis. In this, the patient's vision could not be revived much. He got some 6 by 6 G, but the chain can be put to use. Uh, only advantage of that case, uh, I'm surgery in that case. So this is another case with the simple foreign body you can make out. With the metal osteos, as I told again, we use the rare earth magnet. Aligning is very important. Just align it to the long axis properly. And once it is done, we can use the uh, yellow magnet. So it should never be perpendicular. I mean, parallel, it should be perpendicular to the uh, speed always. You can bring it out, increase the intraocular pressure, and it comes out very easily. Otherwise, we can use the uh, Electromagnet to bring it out, and once the thing comes out, we can use the force of also to the time. Uh, this is another case where we have a traumatic attack with uh, liver, I mean, cardiac death, and with a lot of exudates inside the eye. Once it is cleared, the localization becomes easier. As I told, usually the dominant port is converted to 20 or 90 gauge with the help of uh, MBR, then we use the uh, same magnet. Most of our uh, foreign bodies are fortunately iron because nobody uses the protective glasses. So in this case, the foreign body was somewhere in the periphery, so under the air it was localized and then they go. So this is another case 
in this uh, we had a nightmare because it was such a large foreign body which was just uh, implanted directly on the disc optic disc so you can make out the foreign body you are sitting on the optic disc Because uh, as I told, more than four millimeters foreign body, I don't uh, use a scalar root, I use the nuclear root. Again, we can go for a clear limbal incision rather than a plane incision. And uh, extending, we entered with the forceps. You can make out such a large foreign body on the disc, and it has to be retrieved to the transcript. Uh, and we have got a lot of cases of. Uh, Thorn injury, especially in case of thorn injury, you can make out the thorn body is subscribed to the nuclear root. In this case, we reattached the retina, aisle was uh, injected, but the outcome was poor in this case because the optic nerve was very directly involved in this case. I think for want of time, I'll just skip other cases. And prophylactic antibiotic is must in all these cases because close to 15% they develop endophthalmitis and that too by a very virulent organism, uh, most commonly bachelor series in our series. So we go for Vanco and Septa. Even in the absence of infection, the use of antibiotic is controversial, but still we use. IV antibiotics can be used and it is recommended also uh, for a better outcome in these cases. And the prognosis in these cases mostly depend on the site of the foreign body uh, within the eye, and also it varies on the size and the composition. Inert usually doesn't affect uh, the eye, but it affects uh, only by the mechanical damage to the eye. In case, uh, if it is uh, what you call uh, iron or other thing, it has to be removed immediately because they can they can lead to what you call the metallosis. And in case of uh, copper, usually they have charcoal and the prognosis is really poor in those cases. Uh, so <clears throat> the non-magnetic foreign bodies, again, because of their infection, the difficulty in uh, removing it carries a very bad prognosis than those with the ma uh, magnetic because of uh, the difficulty in extraction. And if the particle rests on the anti-segment, usually the prognosis is relatively good than it on the poster segment. So with that, I would like to again thank the OTSI for giving me this opportunity and with that I can go. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, Dr. Naresh Babu. Wonderful work you have presented. We knew that okay, you are the only person who has a experience of this many IOFB for intraocular foreign body. We thank you for being associated with uh, OTSI. Dr. Grover, sir, would you like to say some? Excellent video is showing the quality of uh, the work that is being done and the uh, kind of spectrum of cases that Dr. Naresh Babu showed. I think uh, uh, we can learn a lot about management of these cases and the prognosis with the cases other than those of uh, non-magnetic ones where the prognosis becomes much more guarded. So I think uh, the whole spectrum was presented very well. Thank you, Dr. Naresh Babu. And Dr. Naresh Babu, what is your experience regarding wooden, wooden foreign body? So we have got a lot of uh, wooden foreign bodies, sir. Actually, yeah. as I told, uh, usually they come with fungal endophthalmitis. Unless, right. unless we remove the foreign body, there is no, I mean, uh, this thing respect for the inflammation. So we have to exactly localize the foreign body and remove that. And for which usually we go for uh, MRI in such cases. So whenever we suspect a wooden foreign body, MRI is our first choice of investigation for precise localization. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Dr. Sharmila. Yeah. You'll be talking about glaucoma. It's the problem of the last one minute. Just a minute, sir. Just a minute. This is an yes, okay. So you can see the screen? No. Oh, one Share screen. Now it's fine, sir. Right. Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. At the outset, I'd like to thank the uh, OTSI and uh, Special thanks to Dr. Naresh for having included me in this. Uh, so I know it is the last topic. I'm sure I'm not going to keep you all very uh, late. So uh, it's, I'm going to be talking about glaucoma following ocular trauma. 
um, uh, in with respect to all the previous speakers who ever has spoken, I think ultimately everybody has to uh, get our help because uh, most of it is patients are going to go in for inflammation. There's going to be a lot of reaction where there is an increase in intraocular pressure, uh, either because of the trauma per se, or it could be because of the steroids that they're using. So ultimately, it's going to be like uh, we, we, we are going to be involved in the whole treatment process. So with that, uh, I would like to say that traumatic glaucoma is one of the major causes of blindness. It is very important to understand the underlying uh, etiology uh, and to also uh, measure the intraocular pressure very accurately because most of the treatment options uh, depend upon the etiology. Um, the uh, mechanism of glaucoma uh, which occurs uh, is usually multifactorial and it is usually heterogeneous. Uh, and the risk of developing glaucoma is different with the type of trauma. So, for example, the chemical exposure, the trauma that occurs because of chemical exposure, the risk of glaucoma is approximately 75%. And when you take into blunt trauma, it's only around 25%. And with the other type of trauma, it is much lesser. And also, it is important to understand the presentation. It might occur very early, where within a day or even a week, you can see that there is an occurrence of high intraocular pressure, or it can occur even years after the injury. And the intraocular pressure elevation is also uh, either reversible, that is, that is what I was talking, it is either because of the inflammation, once it uh, gives steroid, it will settle down, or it becomes really irreversible, where there is a chronic damage, where there is an anatomical damage that occurs in the angle, causing angle recession. So there are a lot of reports uh, which have looked into the factors uh, which are responsible uh, for the development of glaucoma. And uh, the most important ones identified are the advancing age, when there is an injury to the lens, uh, when the presenting intraocular pressure is extremely high, when there is high femur, when there is increased pigmentation in the trabecular meshwork, and of course, when there is angle recession of more than 180 degrees. So the most important thing that we rely on is the intraocular pressure measurement. But the main challenge here is how do we measure the intraocular pressure in these eyes? Because most of these eyes have a penetrating trauma. They have scarred corneas, edematous corneas, where you have always an irregular uh, myers and you don't get an accurate measurement. So the instrument, what you choose is also very important. So you just go in for uh, uh, smaller tonometers like the rebound tonometry, the toner pen, uh, the transpalpebral diatom tonometer. Or sometimes you might have to just rely on a digital palpation by taking into account that the other eye is normal and you just compare it with the other eye. And one more important test that I would like to uh, uh, emphasize here is the gonioscopy. Yeah, the gonioscopic is a tool, is a very important tool to identify the angle recession. But mind you, it's not important to do it in every case. You will have to identify that a penetrating trauma or a new or, or, or an open wound, it's, it's better not to touch those eyes. And you have to just look at uh, patients who have blunt trauma uh, and look for angle recession. So uh, not all uh, patients come up with high intraocular pressure following a trauma because you do have situations like this where there is a low intraocular pressure, especially when there is a ciliary shutdown or when there is a cyclodialysis. So the mechanism of glaucoma, as already I mentioned, it is heterogeneous and it differs according to the type of injury. For example, the closed globe injury is one which has a very high intraocular pressure. It is very severe to treat and it requires mostly surgical intervention. And the possible mechanisms involved here are either an angle recession or mechanical damage to the trabecular meshwork or because of an excess of pigment that is dispersed and blocking the aqueous overflow pathway. Uh, whereas you see the open globe injury, there are more chances of direct trauma. That is, it is either a direct trauma to the lens causing a lens subluxation, uh, more of a, a dislocation, and that is causing a pupillary block or an angle closure, and that is causing more of a, a inflammation, ghost cell glaucoma, etc. That is leading to a high intraocular pressure. And you look at the chemical injury, the alkali burns are more uh, uh, notorious than the acid injury. The possible mechanism for this is it causes a shrinkage of the collagen and the contraction that leads to trabecular uh, sclerosis. It decreases the spaces in the trabecular meshwork, thereby it decreases the outflow. And it might also lead to pupillary block by uh, uh, also leading to inflammation and posterior sinicae. So the management of traumatic glaucoma can be just simple if you just identify the cause and you eliminate it, or it may be really very challenging depending upon the uh, mechanism of damage. Uh, so most traumatic glaucomas, we all start off with conservative management, like first start off with steroids, uh, uh, give up ad give adequate steroids, and then uh, you give cycloplegics to relieve the ciliary spasm to prevent the posterior sinicae and also to have a good visualization of the uh, posterior segment. And uh, one uh, might have to think about uh, performing a peripheral iridotomy when you see a uh, the, the, there is evidence of pupillary block. And if, it, if the reason for the high pressure is because of the uh, lens, then one, one have to knock out the lens by doing a cataract 
cigarette extraction. If it is because of the blood which is present, you have to uh, 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 wash the blood out by doing an AC wash. And if it's really refracted to any of these treatment, uh, in spite of all this, then I might have to think about going in for a, a, a conventional trabeclectomy surgery or a glaucoma drainage device, or sometimes we might have to consider uh, cyclophotocoagulation as well. Uh, the medical management, as already previously discussed, it has fairly a good uh, response uh, in most of the cases. Uh, so there has been uh, reports, uh, studies which have looked at this and they found good, fairly good uh, uh, outcomes with just the medical management. So you have to include a lot of steroids and cycloplegics and uh, with the anti-glaucoma medications, the, most of these patients respond well. Uh, however, we might have to consider trabeclectomy in uh, certain patients who are refractory to the medical management or when there is an extensive damage to the trabecular meshwork or the angle recession, then you have to look into uh, a trabeclectomy. And whenever we are use, doing a trabeclectomy, it's important to use antimetabolites because most of these patients have a high fibrotic response. And most of them are younger patients who have more prone for trauma. And so there's a higher chances of fibrosis. And with chemical injury, it's better not to use uh, mitomycin C. So it is important to identify what is the type of injury and uh, and the need for anti-metabolites has to be decided based on that. Uh, the glaucoma drainage devices is a, another important uh, uh, modality of uh, uh, treating uh, these patients because with trabeclectomy, the outcomes are unpredictable because of the uh, uh, fibrosis that is involved with it. So we go for either an RD with a supramid stenting or an uh, Ahmed glaucoma valve. And uh, also in patients who do not have a good conjunctival uh, um, uh, 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 approximation, we might have to think about uh, uh, using autograft or any amniotic membrane graft to cover the tubes. Uh, the micropulse or the diocyclic photocoagulation is also very useful in patients whom we cannot risk a surgery. So we can just uh, go for a micropulse cycle photocoagulation where it can be used fairly with uh, good results with uh, in patients with uh, good uh, visual acuity. And uh, with endoscopic cycle photocoagulation, if one has an uh, uh, access to that, it is also giving a better visualization and you can uh, you can really visualize what you're doing. So the, you, you'll be able to predict the outcome with endoscopic cycle photocoagulation. So uh, what are the uh, treatment modalities uh, according to different clinical scenarios? Uh, so the angle recession glaucoma is one that is most common. And most of these patients with angle recession, you see that there is high FEMA and 7 to 10% of them develop glaucoma several years after injury. I would like to emphasize that not all patients go in for glaucoma. So basically the term glaucoma comes in only when there is an optic nerve damage. So what we're talking about most commonly is the ocular hypertension, which means that there's only a response of high intraocular pressure. So it is very important to follow up all these patients who have an angle recession of more than 180 degrees, at least a six month or one yearly follow up to see if there is any progression in the disc damage. Uh, and uh, most uh, most patients will respond very well with anticholinergic, uh, with uh, anticholinergic medications. It's preferable to avoid cholinergic agents because they may impair the UVS lead outflow because there's already a trabecular uh, damage and you depend upon the UVS lead outflow. This will impair that and so there may be a high intraocular pressure response. So if it is refractory to that, then you might have to go for a surgical procedure. Uh, and here it is very clear if it is because of the lens, I'm very happy because I know the pathology is because of the lens. And once I knock out the lens, it is going to be uh, clear and uh, the intraocular pressure is going to come down. So you see situations like this, whether there is a partial subluxation with a pupil block or there is a totally dislocated lens in the vitreous cavity, uh, which is causing a high intraocular pressure. So you knock out the lens either through an anterior approach or a posterior or, or a posterior approach. Then there are also penetrating trauma like this, where there you have a direct uh, lens uh, capsular touch or a lens capsular injury that has caused a leaking uh, uh, lens material that has caused a, a high uh, macrophagic response, causing a, a blockage of the trabecular outflow pathway and uh, increasing the intraocular pressure. Uh, and uh, having said that, uh, with, we've seen uh, Dr. Naresh uh, to, uh, talking about a lot of intraocular foreign bodies. So any kind of uh, uh, pa a patient who's not responding to a good uh, uh, steroid therapy or anti medications always have to suspect for any retained intraocular foreign body. And high FEMA. This is very, very important because most of our patients who have blunt trauma, they come with high FEMA. So more, uh, what do we do with high FEMA? Do we jump and do an AC wash for all of these patients? Uh, no, it is not required because only 5% of patients with traumatic high FEMA will need a surgical intervention. So when do we need to do a surgical intervention? Again, it depends upon the intraocular pressure. If the intraocular pressure is more than 50 for more than five days, or if it is more than 45 and it is present for more than seven days, if it's more than 35 and present for more than two weeks, or if there are obvious signs of corneal blood staining and a total eight ball high femur 
uh, or when there is an obstruction to the vision for quite some time, that might be a risk of going in for amblyopia in children and in patients with sickle cell anemia when intraocular pressure is more than 24 for more than two days. So all these are indicators for doing an AC wash. And uh, with that, uh, there is also uh, uh, patients who develop hemolytic or ghost cell glaucoma because of the hemoglobin filled macrophages and uh, degenerated red blood cells that go and block the uh, aqueous outflow pathway. So this, we might have to uh, go for a trabeclectomy in these patients. And orbital hemorrhage, uh, uh, it was uh, very nicely uh, uh, talked about earlier, so I'm just skipping that. But one thing what I want to really emphasize here is uh, we, the, the more the pressure, uh, the more the, the volume of the eye increases, there is more of a compromise that is uh, happening on the optic nerve because of the compression. So one has to very uh, crucially evaluate the pupil. You have to look at the uh, color vision. You have to see that there is no uh, 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 pale uh, retina or a pale disc that is causing a uh, uh, compressive optic neuropathy. And uh, with uh, uh, that, I would just like to uh, present one case uh, uh, scenario here. A 29-year-old male presented with defective vision in the right eye uh, following a cracker injury. And he presented with a hand movement vision in the right eye and he had uh, epithelial edema and there was lens matter uh, in the anterior chamber. The, it was he had a mature cataract with a very high intraocular pressure of 50 and the angle recession of uh, more than 180 degrees was noted in the right eye. The left eye was apparently normal. Uh, the B scan showed an inferior vitreous hemorrhage, myopic globe. There was no evidence of RD or CD. Patient was started on maximum oral and topical medications. And at uh, one week after that, uh, we reviewed the patient and he had persistent intraocular pressure of 46 millimeters of mercury. Because of his angle recession and because of the uh, long-standing uh, um, uh, sequelae of this uh, uh, problem that has happened after the trauma and also because of uh, non-responsive to medication, we decided to go for a triple surgery. So uh, surgery was planned and uh, on table, I somehow felt that, uh, um, I'm sorry, the video is not playing. I'm not sure why the video is not playing. Actually, I decided I changed my mind because uh, I had uh, seen an uh, obvious subluxation there and a little bit of vitreous. So I anticipated that this is uh, a combined procedure in this patient might have more problems because of the vitreous block that might block the ostium. So I decided to do only a cataract surgery here. So uh, uh, on post-op day one, this, the surgery went on well. On post-op day one, the picture was like this. Uh, visual acuity was 6 by 18. Intraocular pressure was 22. Uh, however, there was some retained cortex which was seen at uh, 10 o'clock. And uh, some posterior segment showed signs of uh, decompression retinopathy with some minimal cortex in the inferior vitreous. This patient had a pre-existing uh, PCR, uh, and uh, mm, uh, which was uh, actually, we could have picked it up by doing an anterior segment OCT to see the integrity of the posterior capsule preoperatively so that uh, it would have been much uh, easier to plan the surgery. So this patient uh, postoperatively, he was managed with only anti-glaucoma medication and he's doing quite well. So the take-home message here is it's very important to identify the exact cause for the uh, tra uh, traumatic uh, sequelae and a prompt treatment is uh, uh, to be initiated. Careful monitoring of intraocular pressure, the angle status, the pupils, uh, the disc and lens status is very important. It is important to treat the underlying cause for the high intraocular pressure. Most traumatic glaucomas uh, due to blunt trauma generally require a surgical intervention. Otherwise, most of them generally respond with anti-glaucoma medications and steroid therapy. So individualize the treatment option based on the mechanism of glaucoma. Thank you for patient hearing. Thank you, Dr. Amila. That was a very comprehensive coverage um, in a very short time, covering all aspects, including surgical management, so well. Um, would you say uh, where you would choose uh, AGV and where you would choose the other wall, Adi, Ed, wall? So the, the choice of the device will depend upon uh, the intraocular pressure that is presenting intraocular pressure and the most importantly, the uh, amount of disc damage. Because uh, in AGV, we will get an immediate intraocular pressure control. So whenever there is a threat to vision because of a very high intraocular pressure and we need an immediate uh, intraocular pressure control, I prefer to go for an AGV. Whereas in the non-valve devices, we usually uh, wait for the uh, ligature suture to give away and then there is an encapsulation that happens for six weeks, hypertensive phase. And then uh, in that interim time, there is still high intraocular pressure. So that might be a threat to the vision. So we choose based on the intraocular pressure and the optic nerve uh, damage and the field damage. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? 
Mehul? Which is the role of a micropulse laser? The micropulse laser, uh, to me, it appears just like a transient, uh, when you need a uh, transient reduction in trochlear pressure or when there is a threat to uh, surgical intervention because of an extremely high intraocular pressure, the complications due to surgery as a result of high intraocular pressure is very high. Uh, I would prefer to do a micropulse so that I will temporize the intraocular pressure to an optimum range uh, for after which I can take for a safe sur surgery. Right. I think with that, if there are any audience questions, you can take them up. Otherwise, we I can. not now. I did not receive any new questions. It is they are all general question. How will you manage the case of ocular trauma? That's what I received. At least five five people have asked this question. So this is what we are discussing. I think uh, otherwise we'll like to thank uh, the Arvindai Hospital for the initiative and the excellent participation in this. We would hope for a much greater participation from all of you, from Arvind, everybody in the ocular trauma movement to take it forward, much greater effort at collection of data. I think we are all a part of eye gates and we can um, look at that and continue and have a trauma coordinator to try and get the data there so, so that we can draw meaningful conclusions from Indian data and try and take the moment of improving the ocular trauma care in, all across the countries forward. Um, Dr. Mehul, would you like to say something? Dr. Naresh Babu, would you say something first? No, no. Nothing, sir, actually. Dr. Mehul can uh, give the... Question. Thank you, Dr. Naresh Babu, for your kind support. Because uh, because of you only, this has become a more instrumental and uh, we could finish this. It was a very interesting webinar. I hope that we all have learned a lot out of this. And uh, we thank you all speakers and uh, all audience. Excellent. Presentation from all the faculty. Would like to thank uh, all the speakers for a beautiful presentation, for some nice interaction, and for the uh, the audience to be here for a seminar which was three hours long. Yes, Harish Babu. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank you. you, Lord. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And we would like to thank uh, entered people, Dr. Uh, Mr. Rahul, uh, who has supported us for this. Uh, Wonderful webinar, and uh, we stretch it one hour more. Thanks to all the panelists also for excellent discussions. Th thank you, Dr. Paritosh. It was a wonderful talk. Thank you, Lakshmi. Lakshmi. Uh, thank you. Thank you all. Thank, thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.